Welcome to the Environment Committee meeting. Um, I'd like to welcome the members of the public who are watching this and the members and the officers present. Um, we've got a long meeting and we've got rather a lot of questions, so I'll go straight to um, a roll call and see who's present. Vicky? Good evening, members. Councillor Bruce? <coughs> sorry, Berry. Councillor Bruce Berry. Councillor Berry present. Thank you. Councillor Cameron. Good evening, present. Councillor Cook. Good evening, present. Councillor Corkhill. Good evening, everyone, present. Councillor Cox. Hello, we am present. Councillor Fawkes. Yes, Chair, present. Councillor Muspratt. Present. Councillor Norbury. Yeah, present. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Councillor Irene Williams. Present. Councillor Wright. Good evening, present. And Councillor Gray is, of course, in the chair. I think that's all the members present. Thank you, Chair. That's brilliant. Thank you, Vicky. Um, so the Members' Code of Conduct and declarations of interest, are there any declarations of interest for us to note? Should we take that as a no? Perhaps, Chair, we can just note that there formally are no apologies and I think there's no declarations of interest. Oh, Councillor Fawkes has put his hand up to declare an interest. My, if I may, Chair, it wasn't on the declaration of interest, it was on the issue of apologies and attendance at tonight's meeting. Um, I just want some clarity and, and some openness. Uh, I, I might be totally wrong, so I won't mention any names, but it's been, I've received information, a number of my colleagues have received information, that uh, a member of tonight's committee has been, had the whip suspended from uh, this uh, party. And I was asking, for the minutes, what capacity, if that is true, what capacity would that member's attendance be noted in? Would it be as a Conservative councillor or whatever party has been whipped from, uh, the whip's been suspended from, or would it be as an independent or in what capacity? I'd just like some clarification so that when we do make decisions, they're not deemed illegal by, uh, you know, for uh, things like uh, judicial review, etc. I just want to be absolutely clear what the status of all the members are. Thanks, Steve. Could we have clarification on that, please? Councillor Fawkes, as far as I'm aware, none of the political groups have requested that they replace any of the members on the committee this evening. Um, so that's the position that we are, we are in at the present time. Obviously, um, I, I don't want to disclose any information in relation to personal issues about individual members because clearly that wouldn't be appropriate. Okay. Uh, so, not, not continuing, but I will certainly be writing and I would encourage other members to write if, if the information I have is true, uh, to write to the chief exec or the legal officer um, and possibly uh, make a reference uh, whether this is something that should go to the standards committee. Thank you for that. Can that be noted, please? Yes, Chair, we can note that. Thank you. Um, I, I, I've apologised. I've, I've missed something out. I'm supposed to have um, read out the, the webcast notice, so can I just read that out, please? Um, the webcast notice is, this meeting will be webcast and a record retained on the Council website. For those at home viewing the webcast, I would like to inform you that if you look above the video, you will see a resources tab. Select this and a link to the agenda will appear in the right hand side. This will allow you to open the agenda in PDF form and follow the discussion and debate. So, so apologies about that. And just a reminder to all members to turn your microphones off and your cameras off when you're not speaking. Thanks very much. Um, so if you've finished the um, declarations and the uh, attendance, we can look at the minutes 
And does anybody have anything to say about the minutes? They seem like an accurate record to me. Can we agree that they're an accurate record of the last meeting? Helen. Um, yeah, hi. I'm not sure if it's a typo or if my uh, point uh, wasn't recorded. So we were looking at the work programme. I was first to speak. I said I was concerned about litter and that can cover obviously enforcement and it can cover a good story if we've got one. Um, what's appeared in the uh, motion that was resolved is to include road safety, grass verges, Hoylake Beach and parking charges. Parking charges was already on the original one from October. There'd already been a working group on parking charges, so that isn't an addition. However, I had asked and nobody had disputed the fact that as a committee, we really should look at the problem of litter, particularly because uh, there's masks involved now and it disturbs me. It's really worrying. So it may be a typo <laughs> or maybe the way the work program is being structured. Um, I'm slightly out of the loop, but please, could we include litter uh, in whatever format you want to make that unless there's any objections? I don't object to that. I think that's a good idea. Does anybody object to that? Can that be noted and, and um, uh, included? Yes, we'll note that chair and amend the minutes accordingly. So the minutes are approved subject to that amendment. Thanks. That's great. So we're, everyone's happy with that. Thanks, Helen. Thank you, Vicky. So the next item, item number five, is um, public and member questions. And um, we have, we do have quite a few public um, questions. So I'm not sure if everybody is present now. We, we there was a question mark over whether all our members of the public were present. Vicky, are they, are they present now? Do we know? Right. Okay. So, um, okay, so I've got question two is Gail Jenkinson. Is Gail Jenkinson here? Gail, could you read your question for us, please? Oh, they're not in. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the meeting. Um, I believe Gail Jenkins is going first. Can everybody mute their microphone? <laughs> Seems to be a delay. Hello, are you ready for me? Uh, yes, Gail, we're ready for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, committee members. Um, will the members of the committee continue to back the unanimous declaration of a climate emergency by reflecting that emergency in all decisions, including those on Hoylake Beach? which necessitate the development of sand dunes to combat the rising sea levels which threaten to flood parts of the world. And that's my question. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Gail. And thanks for keeping to your time limit. Um, I'm, I'm happy for committee members to, um, to answer to that question now. Can we, uh, I'm, I'm assuming we can take a quick vote. We could go by assent. Um, I'm, I'm certainly happy to bear in mind the um, the, the climate emergency, the environment emergency, which we declared unanimously. Can I take it that all committee members agree to do that as we make any decisions? I'll take that as a yes then. So I think the answer to your question is yes, we will. Uh, Thank you. I think I get a supplementary question yes. if I want to. Um, so Presumably that means that there won't be any more confusion with um, contractors um, or appearing to be on the beach um, raking up the sand in areas that are nothing to do uh, with what they said they were doing, like that's happened recently. Sorry, could you could you repeat that? The, Sorry, yes. Um, I just here on the screen and, and it made a noise. I didn't catch what you were saying. So uh, presumably, um, if everybody's backing that declaration, could, um, will that be made? Um, 
obvious to the contractors or whoever it is because there was recently raking activity on the sand in at Hoy Lake. Um, yeah, I think your question, your supplementary question, is um, matches one of the later questions that we've got about Hoy Lake Beach and letting people know in advance that uh, what's what's going on on the beach. So I think the answer to your question is yes, that that that, that will be the case. Right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Um, so we've got the next question is Gillian Homery. Is Gillian here? Gillian, would you like to ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 So um, thank you, uh, committee members and chair. Um, I would like to ask the committee if the relevant councillors could be informed in advance of any work scheduled for Hoylake Beach and Hilborough Island. I suggest at least, at least one week's notice to be given unless there is an environmental incident which makes the, atten uh, the um, attendance of contractors vital for public safety. However, in such an emergency, the chair of the committee should be informed immediately in any case. I would also ask them if any such planned work could be posted on the council website one week in advance. This is partly to avoid wasting police time. Concerned members of the public who monitor the beach recently called them out to attend what they reasonably believed to be a wildlife crime taking place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for this question. As chair, um, I'm, I'm, I'd like to, to find out what the other members think, but I'm happy to define relevant councillors as meaning um, the local ward councillors and the members of this committee. Um, is that, is that okay with you, Gillian? If we, if yes. we really relevant councillors. So relevant councillors being local ward councillors for that ward and members of this committee. Um, and yes, um, that that strikes me as a really good idea that we could do that, so that it, the, uh, advance warning could be given of any works where possible and put on the um, the council website. Um, yes, thank you for your question. Do you have a supplementary question? Um, no, I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chair and councillors. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Um, the next question I have is for... It's, should we, we've got all the questioners in because I don't want to miss out the first questioner who wasn't here earlier. They're all here now. So Simon is asking the first question, which I believe is a question on street lighting. Um, Simon, are you, are you OK to ask your question now? Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Great. Um, so you can ask your question now. Right, OK. Yeah, it's just um, an update on, you know, obviously list card, I feel as if it's been neglected in this street scene thing because they've been telling us last year about the programme that's going to deal with the lights there, but they seem to have omitted it. And I'm just a bit concerned because obviously there's a lot of safety issues with the neighbours as well. I've been campaigning with a lot of the residents here. So despite all the logs, they, have, like, they haven't really provided me with any information. I just want to know why they have been so slow at getting these sorted, you know, and I just want to know if there's any promise of the work being completed soon, because we've been very anxious about this, and it's a year now where the delays caused. So since that meeting, they gave us a schedule, but they haven't kept to it. So I'm just quite concerned that they haven't kept that schedule they're doing everywhere else. So there has to be a reason why they left this call out. I know you explained to me in an email recently about the sort of like the resources, but they have wasted resources on areas where there weren't any faults, and I've got proof of those. So I just want to know why they've done that and not tackle this card, which has got a serious problem. You know, there's like 40 odd lights out. They've done a few, drip fed a few over the last few months, but it's not enough. So even the shops are like concerned about it. And I've spoken to the health centre and they raised an issue about one whole stretch of road with this card village having no lights, which is not safe for all the patients who use that place. They've replaced those three now under duress. I've noticed you've done it recently, so maybe that's a temporary repair. But I just want to find out there needs to be a joined up thinking here and they haven't done that and that's why i've been so critical about it and i've had to keep going on and on at great expense and great sort of length to sort of assert these like you know demands to get these jobs done i'll leave that with you anyway so if there's an answer to that i appreciate that do you want the, i've got an answer provided by the um street lighting team do you want me to read the answer now or would you like that to be published with with all the questions and answers on the um council website um, well, if you could do it now, I could, you know, I could do that. You have to bear with me. Try and access all the other stuff later on, you know. 
Okay, so th this is a substantial answer, so just bear with me, please. It oh, says all, all the council street lighting on main roads were replaced with more reliable and energy efficient LED lanterns in tw 2016. The council's remaining 28,000 street lights on all its other roads are currently being replaced with LED, and this work will be completed by autumn 2021. There is a location-based schedule of work of this replacement program set by our supplier SSE based on most efficient use of their resources and value for money for the council. Meanwhile, we have significantly improved the online process by which customers can report routine street lighting faults. Where available resources allow, we aim to attend to priority repairs within 15 working days. The majority are repaired during the first attendance, but if supply faults or replacement equipment is identified, this can take a lot longer to resolve. There are currently about 5% of our streetlights not working at any one time, which is similar to the national average. But we aim to improve this once the LED programme is concluded. And that's the answer that, that I've been provided for. Okay. Yeah, forgive me, this is this is fairly new in my, in, in my uh, you know, yeah. it's not my area of expertise. Um, so I appreciate your question. And are you happy with that answer? Yes, um, it is sort of partly answering, but like I said, the nagging thought is that um, there's some inconsistencies which I had to raise and those haven't been answered even now. I think that's just why I've been so persistent about it because I don't know if I'm allowed just another supplementary addition to what I've just asked there, but I'll bring up this inconsistency if that's okay with you. Yeah. You get a um, one supplementary question. You get, you do get a one minute supplementary Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's just that the, what you've just said, bearing all that in mind, they have actually left out areas, and I don't understand why they've done that, because you said it's all due to priority. But if those areas have been without lights for five years, surely they should have been even temporarily repaired. I know you say resources are, well, it dictates what has to be deemed a priority, but we're talking about black spots that have been left, like Seacombe, there's one road there, Liscard's got some areas. And I wanted to know why they replaced lights that weren't broken in the first place, because that is surely a waste of resources, because they've got proof of four roads where they replaced everything. And there was no faults with them at all. It was they were even had LED lights. So why replace LED lights with LED lights? I don't understand. They've never given me an answer to that. But this card needed them first. And we were told last year that it would be the first area to be tackled. They did all the lights, but then they left it. So here we are another year. I know next year is the year they plan to finish it, but it's just isn't acceptable that we've got to wait another year for these lights to be sorted. So that's why I have to keep sort of emphasizing Liscard is an area that needed to be tackled. I know we discussed this with Julie as well in the past and Stuart, but it gives you an idea of how long it's gone on for. It's three years now since I did the first meeting at full council and they just haven't given us a coherent answer. Everything you've just said is what they've said to me, but it still doesn't answer those nagging questions. So uh, it, it let me drift. Thank you. For that. Thank you for the question. Thank you. I appreciate the answer anyway. So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that they, all your questions are addressed and we'll put our answers on, on the website for you. Okay. Um, That's great. Liz. Anyway, I appreciate that. that. And if you, Although you won't be in the meeting for the next part when we go through the rest of the agenda, if yeah. you watch it, if you watch the rest of the meeting, you'll see that we are addressing the new street lighting policy. So um, hopefully, um, hopefully, yeah, that will we're working towards addressing any problems that we might have. Okay, that's great. Thanks for your help. Thank you very much for your question, Simon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So the next question we have is from um, Julian Priest. Is Julian here? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Are you okay yeah. to ask your question? You've got two minutes to ask your question. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Thank my you. question is, what internal scrutiny and performance management system is there to be in place monitoring the council officer responsible for Hoylake Foreshore under the new soon-to-be-enacted restructure of the Department for Parks, Allotments and Countryside? Particularly in light of the likely changes to the way that Hoylake Foreshore is to be managed protected in future and the previous disruptive politicization of beach management thank you is that that's your question yep okay i've got an answer that's been provided for me do you want me to read the answer to you or would you like it to be um put on the website with the other um answers because uh, I, did, I didn't know about the officer restructuring so i um had okay. a, a the officer provided me with an answer. Okay. Um, yeah. If you want to read so that. I'll read you. I'll read you what, the, what, what we've got as, as our answer, and then yeah. um, you can ask a supplementary if you need to. So, okay. following the restructure, the appointed managers will be subjected 
to the corporate human re um, resources policies and any concerns about performance or failure to comply with standard corporate response times can be logged through the corporate complaint system. All complaints will be investigated and all complainants will be responded to in line with the corporate complaints policy. With regard to the historical issues raised, I can advise that the current local leader wasn't involved in the 2010 Beach Management Agreement, which expired in 2015, but they did request for it to be taken down from the internet as GDPR concerns have been raised. Um, however, it is our understanding that it remains posted on the Hoylake Village Life website. Um, I think that's the end of that answer. Okay. Have you changed your question? No, no. That that was the question I asked. Um, because obviously the the foreshore management is going to change. Yeah. And being the former secretary of the Sanyo Club, I'm very aware of what has and hasn't worked in the past in terms of beach management. Um, I've, got, I've, got an, I've, I've missed a section off. There is more here. It says the HRA okay. reviewed sand yacht license was submitted to Natural England on the 25th of November at Wirral Council's expense, £3,500 fee. Uh, Natural England have previously uh, permitted the license. However, it remains to be seen what their comments will be this time round. A full account of how information was assembled to inform the new HRA, who was consulted and timescales if, if available, if is available if necessary. Been advised by officers that frequent consultation with the new secretary took place by telephone and email. The new secretary has been kept informed at each and every step throughout the process. Timescales have been aimed at um, recommencement of sand yachting for spring 2021. Does that help, Julian? Uh, it does help. I was already aware that the HRA had been submitted about five days before I submitted my question because we had a San Yacht Club AGM this week. Um, it's interesting to see the content of the HRA, which I'm pretty sure you won't have seen, and it makes reference to wireweed, which is something that probably needs to be considered in terms of beach management. But um, I don't think I have any other supplementary question to ask. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so the next question, question five, we have from Mark Howard. Mark, are you here? Anna, do we have do we have Mark Howard amongst us? Yes, we do. I can see him on the um, meeting list. Um, bear with me a second. I'll just see if I can. Can you unmute your mic, Mark? Is he showing up as muted? Yes, he is at the moment. He is. Okay. Failing that, I could read the question um, and the answer. He's just appeared as waiting in the lobby. Okay, Chair, he's been admitted. Hello, can you see Hello, me? Yes. Hello, Mark. Can you hear us? I can. Sorry, I've just come yes. in on the mobile phone instead. Thank you. Thanks. Over to you, Chair. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Mark, would you like to ask your question? Yes, yes please. Um, thank you. Uh, the question is, will the Council review the recommendations... I can hear you. We've got a long delay. Yeah, sorry about that. Mark, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you and there's no delay on what you're saying, Mark. I'm, I'm getting a bad echo, sorry. Okay. Um, the question is, will the Council review the recommendations of the important GEMET report of 2000? It's this one. The beaches at West Kirby and Hoylake, options for managing windblown sand and habitat change. 
and publish into the public domain an update to that in the light of findings of the new geomorphological survey? That's my question. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So your question is um, about the GEMIT report of 2000 and you want it to go into the public domain. No, that, that report is already in the public domain. But you want to publish it. Will, will the updates to it, will it be updated in the light of the findings of the new geomorphological survey? Right, so um, when we commission new geomorphological surveys, you want that um, we could publish and, and um, draw attention to the fact that there was an original GEMIT report of 2000. Yes, I think that's important. Yeah, I, I don't see that that would be a problem, especially if it's already in the public domain. That 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 should be perfectly reasonable for us to do that. That can that can be published alongside the um, the current geomorphological survey that we that we um, get commissioned. Do you have a supplementary question to go with that? Uh, I do. Um, it is again related to uh, the beach insofar as it is related to the drainage. Um, since surface water drains and the seawall outlets along the promenade are increasingly submerged by sand and therefore no longer fit for purpose, will the council consider alternative and more affordable solutions to discharging surface water from the road? for example, via permeable paving sections and or surface embedded drain channels across the promenade, further avoiding a need for heavy equipment on the beach to clear block outlets. That's the question. Thank you. So to clarify, your question is, is will, will we consider alternatives to the current drainage situation with the um, sand getting in the way all the time, um, such as um, use, uh, drainage channels on the surface? Indeed. So, yeah. so effectively removing the need for heavy equipment to go onto the beach to clear right. the uh, existing drain outlets in the promenade wall. OK, OK, thank you. Um, do we have Neil Thomas on, on the call? Is, is Neil Thomas present? I think, Chair, perhaps if a detailed Hi, response is needed, we could send yeah, it in writing. OK, what I just wanted to say is, is just to ask if it's possible that we can um, look into that and, and then we can we can publish with your question published on, on the website. We can then publish my answer, which is that I'll ask Neil <laughs> Neil to, to um, report back to me about um, whether we can look into that or not, because that sounds like a, a, a very, very sensible suggestion. And I'm sure we can at least investigate um, how how possible and, and uh, the cost of that, how possible that is and, and the cost of that. So that sounds like a really sensible suggestion and I'm sure Neil will be happy to, to look into that for us. Thank you very much, Mark. Is that, is that answer okay? It is. Thank you very much. That's enough for you. So those, those questions, I think that's, is that the last question, Anna? Yes, Chair, it is. Okay, that's the last one. Um, okay, thank you. So those questions um, and the answers um, and any supplementary questions and supplementary answers um, we can make sure that that material is published on the website so that it makes sense um, after this meeting, if anybody is to watch it in the future or to try to refer back to it, that there is a, a comprehensive list of questions and proper answers to that. Um, thank you very much. Um, so that, that was agenda item number five, public and member questions. Um, there is also a statement. Um, we've been notified that there is a statement to be um Read out. Uh, Mr. Brownbill, do we have Mr. Brownbill present? Hello, yes. Paul, is that Mr. Is that Mr. Paul Brownbill? Paul, yes. It is. Okay, Paul, are you ready to read your statement to the committee? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, my statement is in relation to the Hoylake Beach management, um, and. I'd like to say that I'm a Wirral resident, um, however, not from Hoylake and Mells. And I'd like to emphasise that the proper management of the beach is not just a Hoylake and Mells issue. Uh, it's much wider, uh, the whole Wirral and surrounding areas. I acknowledge that there are strong feelings expressed on the issue and also legal obligations required of the, uh, the council. Um, but I would like to um, state my support and the support of many others of uh, recent policy of allowing nature, uh, the natural development of the beach as described in the Natural England report. Having spent 
much time on the beach during the last uh, unusual year. It is clear that the beach is ever more popular, particularly with families, and this natural environment is appreciated by uh, many um, in the area. That's the end of my statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, personally, I, I agree with that, and, and it's very nice to hear somebody say that. So, um, yes, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm very happy that you made that statement. Um, are there any more, Anna, are there any more um, petitions or statements? Chair, yeah, we're not aware of any petitions and there's been no member questions submitted either. Okay, so that's brilliant. No member questions. So that's, thank you very much for all those questions and all those answers and for that statement. Uh, so we move on now to the agenda item six, which is the network management plan. Um, and I believe that the members of the public have left us at this point. Is that right? They can, they can continue to watch this meeting if they wish, but it, they have to watch the broadcast, don't they? Oh, thank you. So from, from this point on, it's it's the committee. Helen, you, your hand is up. Councillor Cameron? It's gone down yeah. now, I think, Chair. Sorry, my, my hand's not been up for uh, uh, since the public question started some time ago. Thanks. Well, it was sorry. It was showing on my uh, screen as your hand was up. So apologies for that. So we can move on to net, the network management plan, which is um, agenda item six. And Simon, um, you're, are you going to introduce this for us? Yes, chair. Sure, happy to do that. Thanks. I mean, we we have read it, but it'd be nice to have a, a, a summary again. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening, chair and members. Um, just in terms of this network management plan. There isn't any statutory requirement for us to have a nominated traffic manager, um, but this, um, sorry, there is a statutory requirement for us to have a nominated traffic management manager, and this recommendation formalises um, the post of um, senior network manager within my service area as, as performing this role, uh, which is, as I say, a statutory requirement. There is also um, a statutory duty for us to secure expeditious movement of traffic and to undertake our duties under the uh, Act, which is the 2004 Traffic Management Act, satisfactorily. Otherwise, there is um, a risk that the Secretary of State has powers to intervene. There's no actual statutory duty for us to have a network management plan but it's considered the most effective way for us to discharge this duty and to ensure that we are clear on, on our policy. Once um, this, is, this is approved, uh, we will consult and engage further with wider stakeholders and communicate and publish the network management plan working with our corporate comms colleagues. So the recommendations to your committee are that you note and we, the report and that you endorse the council's approach to its network management duty and that you approve the, net, the Whittle Network Management Plan in draft and authorise the director of enabled services to finalise any further minor changes in consultation with the chair and spokespersons of this committee. And finally, that you note that the post of senior network manager in highways and infrastructure performs the role of traffic manager for Whittle Council under the Traffic Management Act 2004. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'd just like to say that I, I having read this um, in detail, I'm really pleased with it. I think it's uh, the report is, is is really good news. There's lots of really good stuff in there. There's lots of references to sustainability and to active travel and to cleaning up our air and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it, it's it's a very positive read. So um, I'm very happy to support that. Does anybody have anything? that they want to say about it, any questions or any comments? Yeah, uh, yes, Chair, uh, put my hand up. Uh, Chris Cook's got his up as well, as you can see from here. Thank you. Am I okay to go now, Chair? Do you want to go? Yeah, I, I, I second the, uh, the Chair's statements. It's a very comprehensive report and um, takes a lot of reading and taking in. Uh, I, I may have missed this point, but um, I know it's, it's in draft form and, and it's going to be added to later on. 
Well, I didn't see any um, electric car parking, uh, reference to any electric car parking points uh, and the possibility of a, a bike hire scheme similar to Liverpool and other bigger cities at transport hubs and also car sharing, um, you know, car sharing schemes. I uh, didn't see any reference to them, but I, I may have well missed it. If, if, if I have, I apologise. If I haven't, um, could we have a look at that? Cheers. Simon, do you want to come back to that? Certainly, Chair. So in terms of, of electric vehicle charging points, we are actually rolling out a trial um, as part of the um, lighting LED uh, project. So we, we are in, in installing on-street electric vehicle charging points in, in areas where people haven't got the ability to, uh, to park off-road. Um, and, I, and I think we ought to include some reference to electric vehicle charging in the in the plan, so that that certainly can be taken account of. Um, car sharing schemes, yes, we can certainly allude to that in the plan as well. But obviously, they they are very specific and uh, and, and relevant to certain organisations running them, rather than the council itself, I guess. But we can certainly include that as well. Sorry, Councillor Norbury, I can't remember your other point. I was uh, I was busy jotting down. It was. Um bike hire schemes um, bike hire similar, schemes, yeah. Yeah, yeah similar yeah. to um you know liverpool have got one and other big cities and towns like chester so yeah i mean this plan obviously is is developed and consulted on with partners within the, across the city region so again we can certainly look at that and uh, how we can link in with any schemes that are uh, in the wider city region and and you know build that into the uh, into the narrative yeah certainly thanks simon cheers Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Tony. Does anybody else have um, a point to make or a question? Yes, uh, as announced by Tony, uh, Chris Cook, if that's Great. all right. <laughs> Got a couple Great. of questions, yeah. Um, right, I was just going to quote something from... Uh, th thank you for the very comprehensive report. It was very informative. First of all, I'd like to you know, congratulate the officers on putting these reports together. Um, I've just got a linguistic thing, really, about the environmental impact, which um, I will bring up on my screen. Um, yes, it's um, it's the environment. It's point ten and the environment and climate implications. Now, I'll just read. It's very short. It says increasing vehicular traffic growth, longer journey times, increasing congestion, and peak hour spread may result in harmful environmental deterioration as a result of transport related pollution. Uh, I will just change the word may into will because I don't think there's two ways about it. You know, if you've got more uh, vehicles uh, taking longer in traffic um, with idling engines and so on, more congestion, uh, it, you know, there's no may about it. it, it's a will. That was the first sort of comment I would make. Um, there's another reference on page 26 to pedestrians being prioritized. And I'd just like to ask, um, you know, what concrete measures have been taken recently to ensure that that's actually happening because on the sort of diagrams uh, appearing in a few places in the report you've got like a pyramid of hierarchy in terms of who's prioritised and pedestrians go at the top but I'm, I'm noting for example uh, between my ward Prenton and Oxton there's a whole probably half a mile stretch of the A552 a very busy road coming up from the uh, motorway junction up to the shopping area where there isn't even a crossing for pedestrians you know so that's just one example uh, i have another question but i'll just pause there for a moment because i don't want to overload uh short to memory banks <laughs> that's all right thanks chris simon are you able to to respond to that yeah absolutely in terms of the narrative in the report itself and changing the uh the uh the may to to will i'm sure that's something that we can take count of with uh, future reports and um, if if democratic services are able to to, to change sub subsequent to uh, to publication as part of the minutes, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, in terms of pedestrian prioritisation, I think we're talking about where we're introducing new schemes, um, and that, you know we need to be working to that hierarchy. So that that sort of forefront in our minds, if there are um, existing areas of the network where there's a lack of suitable pedestrian facilities then we look at that on a road safety related basis certainly that's great can i ask my third question now yeah. um i mean i did refer to that you know when i took part in the uh, public consultation about how to improve our you know um 
uh, networks for um, active travel and so on. Um, yes, yeah, so, so my third question is, um, there is a reference to, to uh, on page 45, I think it is, uh, local highways maintenance, and there's a, there's a £6 billion uh, government fund available uh, beginning in 2015. Uh, where local authorities could apply for this money uh, on the basis of, of how well they maintain the net networks and the better they did it, uh, the higher sort of funding level they could uh, receive, level three being the highest. And it's not entirely clear to me from the report because there are two references what level we are currently at or heading for. I know the, the aspiration is level three because that attracts the highest level of funding. So that's my first part A to that question. Are we in three or we're we trying to get to it? For, the, for this last, I think it's the last of six years that this is available. And then the other thing is it doesn't mention the report where we've been in the past, you know, in 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19. Uh, have we been at level three and getting the full funding or only at level two, for example? Yeah. Yes, Chair, I can answer those if that's OK. Um, so in terms of the this is this is part of what's called the DFT um, self-assessment criteria and, and it's probably more linked to the next item on the agenda, which is about the highway infrastructure asset management plan and strategy. Uh, but it's alluded to in this network management plan, but I can answer it now for sure. So we are at level three. We're at level three now, and we have always been at level three, but somewhat by default. And it's because we're part of a devolved city region. Um, so we've got that level three status, and we've got until February 21 to prove that we meet level three in order to get to get that level of funding. We've got independent experts helping us out with meeting that criteria to make that self-assessment, which I think is, as I say, uh, mentioned in the uh, in the subsequent agenda item on this committee. Um, and we are, at this moment in time, very close to being able to demonstrate that we meet level three unilaterally and not just by default as being part of the city region. Yeah, thanks very much for Thank that you. comprehensive answer, I think. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Simon, for the answer. Any other questions? I, I'm apologies. I just cannot see who's got their hand up. It's, it's I've got random hands showing on mine apparently. I've got a so. question, Liz, if that's all right. Yes, go on, Andy. Thanks, thanks, Liz. Uh, hi, Simon. Um, my question is kind of in reference to the um, the monitoring and review action plan section in the report, um, specifically about the freight routes. Um, and the freight routes after Brexit in uh, regarding any potential congestion that we're going to have on the world. It was just something that, that came to my mind after the spokes meeting that we had, whether any spaces on the world had been identified for trucks to wait, basically. I know the Liverpool City region itself have got some ideas about how they're going to do that with the port of Liverpool um, in, in, in the LCR, in, in Sefton and even in Lancashire. Um, but I, I worry that this might become quite a big issue in the future, especially regarding clean air and um, and uh, with the carbon problem too. Thanks, Andy. Simon, are you able to respond? Thanks, Chair. Yes, certainly. Councillor Corkill, in terms of um, freight, obviously we have got a major um, freight route through um, to Ireland from the uh, the, the, the Birkenhead um, uh, ferry service. So. Um, take on board what you're saying and certainly Peel Ports will be a major consultee as part of this plan um, and, and we will ensure that we uh, we consider that in, in that in that process. Thanks, Thanks Simon. Simon. I'm just I'm just really aware it's re it's coming right up on us, you know. It's yeah. a matter of weeks away now. Thanks. Thanks Andy. Are you happy with that answer, Andy? No. It's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, if it's being looked into, that's great. I think we're, we're, we're getting really close to the edge now and a lot of things are still to be sorted out. I just, I would hate to, uh, when, when I, basically this question arose from a, a, a question I asked of the LCR and the question wasn't massive, wasn't answered in too much detail there either. So um, it's difficult to know how to, to it's difficult to know what's going to happen after we, um, after we leave the, the European Union, I just don't want to see the we're all clogged, clogged up on all its narrow roads with, with trucks. No, that's a really, really important point. I think that we all agree with that. Thank you, Andy. Uh, uh, can I just come back in again, Chair? Sorry. Simon, yeah. Yeah, I, w I, w I will take that away and we'll look at that. I and mean, obviously uh, Brexit is on the corporate risk register for the council. 
uh, and my service is, 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 you know, has got its own risk register for its own operations. So as, as part of that, um, you know, freight and build up of freight is, is there. So we'll look at that, but specifically in relation to your question about, uh, about uh, heavy goods vehicles and, and the port, certainly do that soon. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Joe. Andy, you, you're happy with that? Yeah, that's, that, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Um, Chair, Councillor Fawkes has a question, I think, and I think Councillor Norby had his hand up, but that appears to have gone down now, so I'm Steve? not sure. <sighs> yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, I mean, clearly this plan sits alongside or in a hierarchy of other plans, and perhaps for committees, uh, benefit you can you can tell us where that sits and just um obviously this is an electronic document so where we have got references to for example the liverpool city region uh combined authority transport plan we, we could have an electronic link to that document uh, because some of the things that members have talked about will be in that document and you, i don't suspect you want to repeat them uh, throughout throughout all, all the other documents so a where we sit in the hierarchy of legislation national liverpool city region and the uh, cross-referencing of all these other policies via electronic link would be very helpful. Thanks, Steve. Do we have any other any other questions? Simon, were you going to come back to that? If you'd like, Chair, yeah, it's just to say that certainly we can put hyperlinks into to key documents, and I've made a note of that, so we can do that as part of the final version. Um, in terms of the hierarchy, I can say that the, the network management plan probably sits at the top of the hierarchy. They just th this and the, the the subsequent agenda item about um, higher infrastructure ma asset management plan, they kind of fit into different legislation. So this is this is about network and traffic flow. So it's the Traffic Management Act 2004, whereas the Highway Infrastructure Asset Management Plan is more around the Highways Act and obligations and um, uh, you know functions that we perform under under that that legislation and statute thank you thanks simon does anybody else have any questions about this so i'll just remind people of the recommendations the committee has recommended to note the report and endorse the council's approach to its network management duty to approve the draft rural network management plan and authorize the director of neighborhood services to finalize any further minor changes in consultation with the chair and spokespersons of the Environment, Climate, Emergency and Transport Committee, and to note the post of senior network manager, highways and infrastructure, forms the role of traffic manager for Wirral Council under the Traffic Management Act 2004. Are we happy to agree to that? If, if you're moving that chair, I'm more than happy to second it. Great. Thanks, Steve. Nobody disagreeing with that, so that's okay then. Okay, Vicky, have you got that? Yes, we've taken that as moved by yourself, seconded by Councillor Fawkes, and it's been agreed by assent. That's brilliant. Thanks, Vicky. Right, so moving on to agenda item seven, which is obviously connected, and that's the highways infrastructure asset management policy strategy and street lighting policy. Simon, um, are you going to briefly talk us through this again and the connection with the previous report? Thank you. Yes, Chair, certainly. Um, so the Highway Infrastructure Asset Management Policy and Strategy documents are not new documents. They've actually been approved before um, last January under a Cabinet Member decision. Um, they've now been refreshed, working with our um, uh, advisors, and they align with the, the Wirral Plan 25 now and with the DFT self-assessment that I spoke about earlier, which needs to be done and submitted in February 21. They also reflect current management structures, and it's also opportune, I think, to bring them to the, the new committee of yours, which covers this portfolio. The policy document is, is high level. It contains two key statements on how we will operate. I'll briefly read them out, if that's all right. It's that the council will publish and operate a formalised highway infrastructure asset management strategy aligned to the corporate vision and ensure the optimal use and direction of the council's resources in managing and maintaining the borough's highway assets for the benefit of current and future stakeholders. Plans and practices will be developed and reviewed to support the strategy. And statement two is that 
Wirral Council will plan all aspects of maintenance, intervention and treatment choices using a formalised asset management risk-based approach, taking into consideration the safety of stakeholders, the prevailing budget environment, customer expectations, network hierarchy, levels of service, network condition and social and environmental impact. The, st the strategy document is more detailed and provides the overall framework of how we will deliver an effective highway infrastructure asset management in legislative context. It's vital that we have and publish these documents to help us achieve the DFT incentive fund level three. Otherwise, our capital funding allocation will significantly decrease and we will risk serious reputational damage. Street lighting is an intrinsic component of our overall highway and infrastructure asset that is extremely high profile with customers and members and the policy document for street lighting sets out our five-year plan for managing our lighting stock. It should be noted that there are actually six more plans and documents feeding out of the overall highway infrastructure strategy, not included in these papers, including the performance management framework, which will enable us to report performance in line with agreed city region KPIs, as well as operational service plans containing details of how we deliver highway management services at an operation level. However, we, we bring in the street lighting policy individually because that's actually been in the forward plan all year and, as I say, is, is a key uh, document for, for members and for the public. Once approved, again by committee, as with the network management plan, we'll consult and engage with wider stakeholders and we'll communicate and publish our policy and strategy documents working with corporate comms. So the recommendations to your committee are to note and endorse the authorities' approach to highway infrastructure asset management and to approve the draft 2020 Highway Infrastructure Asset Management Plan, Highway Infrastructure Asset Management Strategy and the 20 to 25 Street Lighting Policy and to authorise the director to make any further amendments that the director considers will correct errors or omissions or otherwise aid in the operation of the policy in consultation with the chair and spokespersons of this committee. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Simon. Thank you for that. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments about item seven? Chair, I think Councillor Cook and Councillor Cameron have their hands up. Thank you. Councillor Westcott. Thank you. Chris? Right, yes, thanks, Chair. Um, just um, a question, but really about, um, I suppose it's customer service and preference, really. Uh, being aware, and I wasn't when I initially joined this committee, that uh, street lighting isn't a statutory service provided by authorities, but it's, you know, deemed it's a very high profile and it's very important to residents. I was just wondering if there is any leeway whatsoever uh, with the the sort of luminosity of the newly introduced LED lights. Um, the vast majority of residents are very happy with them. Uh, just a few of them, however, in my ward have got in touch to say, you know, could we negotiate with the authority for slightly softer ones, you know, like you can get in your kitchen and stuff, you've got the very bright white, you've got the softer ones and so on. Uh, I'm just wondering if there is that flexibility, you know, because I think there's some perception that these are just being sort of rolled out without sort of any sort of um, consultation, you know, on a, on a micro level, as it were. Um, and the, the other question is, we had a discussion recently where I think um, uh, it, it was made quite clear that um, all the LED uh, was to be rolled out by September, autumn uh, next year. But there are references in this report, a couple of places, I think, to, to finishing the scheme by early 2022, April 2022. So I'm just wondering if, uh, if, the, if the September 2021 is aspirational, you know, rather than uh, sort of set in stone. OK, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Simon? Yes, Chair, I can answer those questions. So in terms of the luminosity levels, then um, take on board what you're saying. Some residents will view the, the lighting as much improved and, and brighter, uh, and others will see it as too bright. Um, there are extensive um, public um, feedback questionnaires that we're doing with, with tr to try and gain some understanding of how people are, are reacting to what's going in. The, the, there's more than one issue here. Sometimes it's it's the backlighting effect, the uh, the, the sort of distribution of light um, back towards properties, which um, which people are um, dissatisfied with, and, and and obviously on a case by case basis, we can look at that. We can provide certain uh, baffle plates and, and and things like that to to 
to mitigate that. In terms of the lighting levels themselves, the business case for the um, environmental funding through Salix for the for the LED is based on us having a certain amount of dimming of those lights, um, you know, after a certain time uh, during the night. So they're not always as totally as bright as, as, as other times. So there, there is an element of that and there is an element of controllability about the, uh, about the level of illumination as well, which we can, uh, we can control in certain areas if necessary. So that, you know, that is, that is, you know, we are able to do that. In terms of the um, timescales for the, the project as a whole, uh, autumn next year is a contractual date with SSE. It's quite likely that the um, there are, and we've already seen some, um, there, there are additional works that are discovered or found to be necessary during the course of the contract that we might choose to procure via the SSE contract, which will result in an extension of time being legitimately entitled to, uh, them being en legitimately entitled to, which will make the, the contract uh, run on beyond next autumn. There are also a lot of... Um, non sort of lighting and column uh, related infrastructure so i'm talking particularly about old cabling which might may need to be replaced and we're in the process of putting together um a detailed itinerary of of what additional infrastructure works we need to to provide to ensure that we get you know the the maximum value and uh, and benefit from from all this investment in the led contract so that's probably what you know um, is mentioned in terms of potentially running on into 2022. It's not necessarily all the same contract work, but it is in terms of getting our lighting stock fully up to standard. Uh, there will be further works that have not currently been um, procured, which will need to be carried out as well. So all in all, it will probably take us beyond that autumn 21 date to towards early 22. And I think when the policy was written, that would have been uh, would have been known about. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Simon. Thank okay. you. Okay. Th thanks, Chris. Helen, you had a question? Uh, yes. I mean, I would like to acknowledge that um, I think the information for members and the response to issues when we raise them around streetlights has improved massively uh, with uh, Nikki Boardman and her, her team. So I'm pleased that when I raise it, I can get a direct response. What I'm not very pleased about and I would like some clarity on is a response earlier referenced that SSE have some input into the prioritisation. Um, I'd like to see that criteria because it happens on quite a few issues where I look at a list and I carry on down and down the list. I carry on right through the calendar and I find some areas of my ward. Um, and this list is no different. Thornton, Huff and Brimstage. Colton Spittle, Raby and Raby Mayor next September. So it concerns me that the contract ends then. It concerns me that Chris Cook doesn't seem to feel that there's, uh, there's any chance it won't slip. Um, and I just don't know why areas which have some of our oldest residents in get pushed to the bottom of the list when if this tips into another winter, if it goes beyond September and the nights get darker, they are always concerned about their safety and streetlights makes a big difference to how safe they feel. But it doesn't, age does not seem to come into the equation when these programmes are put together. Um, I'd like really to be reassured um, around why it, we have to wait so long for anything, the further towards Cheshire you get. <clears throat> Thanks, Helen. I'm sure everyone in your ward isn't elderly, um, and we do have some elderly people in, in other wards, but I get what you're saying. Hi, thanks, Liz, for that, because obviously we all have all the information from the Rural Intelligence Service, so it, it's quite easy to see, you know, we all know. I'm not saying everybody in the ward is elderly. I'm just saying, is it part of the criteria? It matters a lot to their safety. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. Simon. Thanks, Chair. So... I suppose the uh, the answer is that when we procured this contract originally, we looked at we are obviously looking at replacing street lights across the whole of the borough. Um, we did a substantial number, I think it's about seven and a half thousand or more, um, four years ago on the main roads. And as I say in the report, this this covers the the, the, the remainder of the um, 
of the lights in the borough, including residential areas. But we, we were very, very tight on, on ensuring we had sufficient budget to do this. We had to make a, a business case on, um, on energy saving cost uh, for, for funding that was effectively a loan based on the, um, repaying that loan with the savings that we made on, on energy costs. And to, to try and ensure that we got, um, that we met the, the, um, the whole, that we were able to deliver the whole of the borough within this contract for the budget that was available, we gave the contractor the ability to um, determine where they thought their resources were best placed at any one time to um, give us the best price, I suppose. Um, however, since then, uh, and certainly we will look at uh, this again, uh, but there have been uh, local local ward member um, requests for, for certain locations to be prioritised. Um, and you know we have we have taken cognizance of that where where it's where it's relevant and and, and demographics and and safety of, of residents would be a, a relevant uh, matter but of course there is a cost to pay a price to pay because if the contractor is instructed to switch resources to a different location then they would legitimately pass that on as additional costs so it's just something that we need to be mindful of i would say that um Alongside this, this is a, this is a replacement program. It's a capital scheme. Um, we're not replacing uh, or putting lighting in that wasn't there before. So all these areas should currently be lit, um, albeit with old sodium lighting. So this is an upgrade of lighting rather than putting lighting in that's not currently there. So it's not like we say, you know, some areas haven't got lighting and, and I'm going to have to wait for it. It's um, those areas should be lit and we do have, as is mentioned in the policy document and, um, you know, previous answers to other questions, we do, we do maintain the, the current lighting assets with, a, with a, a reactive and responsive service. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Simon. Helen, are you okay with that? Yeah, thank you. I did, yeah, I, thank you. I did acknowledge that um, when we raised the issue, it's, um, it's, the response is better now. Um, and I'm pleased to hear that um, the demographics are part of your consideration. Um, so, yes, yeah, there's lots of mature trees. And yes, the sodium lights might still be there. But with all of the trees in full leaf going into winter 2021 um, is something I'd really like to avoid. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. Um, Christina, did you have a question next? Yes, I did, Chair, if I may. Um, Simon, we've noticed a problem um, in, in the pinpointing of the lamppost system, which has also been noted by quite a few of our residents, all in similar sort of clusters, because that map doesn't show all the lights. Um, hence, we're told, having repeatedly reported one, no, it's fine. No, it isn't, because it isn't on your system. Um, and we're just wondering if um, the LED lights are going to go into all the existing uh, lampposts, uh, or, uh, well, you know, they're going to be replaced, or are you only going to replace some of them? Because in my ward, and I'm sure other councillors would like to know if they're going to be somehow losing some um, uh, lampposts and also because it's been reported and in one case because it's on the confluence of a number of roads it doesn't fall into the category of you can't report this because it's all already been reported job which we get a lot and um, it's going in as separate ones and residents say we got people coming up to look at the lights again but they never looked at the light that was wrong and then when the LEDs came, they never came far enough up to find the other lights. So we're just worried that some are missed off and we don't know whether it's accidentally or whether it's intentional. And in reference to what Helen said, thank you, Helen, for raising that, because as an elderly person who lives in your ward um, and is quite often in Thornton Huff, yes, it is pretty grim when it's dark because it's a different kind of dark in the country, isn't it, than in, uh, in towns. And um, you, it's not just traffic and things, it's uneven pavements because it's old pavings, it's, it's hedges, everything. So much as I wouldn't like to see the conservation type 
lampposts going, which I understand they're not. Um, I do feel that it it does need good lighting because it's a, a it's a, a thorough a, a very busy road to get to Neston and beyond and um, accidents will happen as we found out sadly in my own ward in Bevington yesterday so that's my question Simon are you taking some out or are you have you just not got them clocked on the system okay thanks for that um, in terms of the the system um, obviously, we have rolled out a new reporting system, which is map based, as you as you allude to. So if there are um, some locations that aren't showing on that system, then we can look at that. Um, I'm, there may be teething issues with the with the map based system in terms of some some locations might not be accurately mapped. And that would be the issue rather than us taking things out. I think that um, as part of the contracts. Um, in terms of are all the lights going to be replaced with LED, the answer is yes. Where it's a lantern replacement um, and we're not replacing a column, we'll be replacing every sodium light in the borough with an LED lantern. Um, and if any have been missed out of a street by as part of the, LED, uh, the SSE contract, then that would be picked up through the supervisor for the contract to, to, and, uh, and, and be a defect on the contract that, uh, that they're required to rectify. In terms of um, every light, every lamp post lighting column, then it, it's not necessarily the case if we're doing column replacements that we will be replacing every column in exactly the same location or in the same number. And that's because LED lanterns are much more effective and provide better illuminance rates and spread than the old sodium column. So if we were replacing all of the columns in a road, for instance, because they were all structurally defective. It's quite unlikely in a residential scenario, but certainly on a main road, there's been instances, the A41 bypasses one, for instance, where we've replaced all the lighting columns because they were all part of a, a, a major capital scheme and there was a high proportion of them that were structurally defective. We've placed them all, but we've been able to, rather than putting 200 back, we've been able to put 150 back or whatever it is because of the, the illuminance um, improvements of LED so that might happen but if that does happen uh, in, a, in a residential scenario um, we will make sure that the the map based system is updated to reflect that because it's an asset it's linked to an asset inventory and an asset database so any land, any lighting column that's taken away from a certain location will come off the map and anyone that goes into a new location will go on the map but as I say, it's a new system. It's more effective, as Councillor Cameron uh, alluded to, um, we think, for, for people to report. But there will always be the odd teething problem. So apologies for that. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Simon. Chair, could I come back on that? Yeah. Um, the particular light that we're reporting has been out over four months. And in that time, a number of people, whether they the contractors or whether they're our employees, have been to look at the other lights, but not got up as far as this one now. It'd be interesting to know how much money that's wasted when you've already explained to Helen that you can't take people from one site to another because they'll um, add it to their bill, if you like. So uh, how how much, will, you know, how many times do people have to be um, asked whether these lighting columns have been missed off the map uh -huh. before somebody acts on it, question one. And question two, I did ask... Are you going to notify councillors when you're either A, taking out a column, for, for good reason, I, I understand what you're saying, so if you're either taking out a column or adding columns, because we are the people on the ground who will be answering the residents about this, and uh, we really, I think it's a cross-party thing, this, we like to have the right answers to give to the residents. Thanks, Christina. Simon? Yeah, certainly. If we're doing any column replacements, um, we should be liaising with the ward councillors and I'll make sure that that's happening, um, and especially if there's going to be any changes to the number of columns. The one you mentioned where there's a light been reported and they've come and repaired it, but not the, the one near it, it's, it's possibly because the one that's been repaired has been 
able to be repaired because certain components within there's about seven different components in a lantern head um oh, sorry you misunderstand me so rather than you you know going on onto that subject no no other lights weren't working they were all working the light that had been pinpointed was ignored they merely looked at the lights around because there's quite a few lights in this area they looked at all of those seemed to shake their heads and go off again this was reported by residents that's happened two or three times saying so they definitely put the led lights in but they haven't got to this one Okay, so if it's if it's if the one they haven't got to is is currently not an LED, then it will be part of the uh, part of the contract to be replaced with an LED. Yes, so yes, that, but it that's... doesn't show on your map. That's the whole point. The point I've made in all this is there are lights that don't show on your map. Therefore, if you're giving that map to your contractors or that information, you haven't got the information on it, so they won't change them. Okay, so we'll happily look at that as a, you know on on the the basis of locating it by the street number or the street name and, uh, and and ensure that it's included in the contract if you want to let me know separately i'll look at that one separately thanks simon there is, is a, it... there is a way of reporting other than than just using the uh, the map as far as i understand we, we can do it manually Thanks, Simon. Um, Andy, I, I think I've got Andy next. Is that right? Andy Corkill, have you got a question? No, I don't. You don't? I'm, I'm, you have to forgive me. I've got hands appearing on the screen um, and I, I keep forgetting that it's just being random for me for some reason. Um, OK, and so does that mean that Chris Cook's hand is not really up as well? Well, it's gone down, Chair, so I don't think there's any hands up at the moment. Yeah, sorry. It, it, OK. Okay, and that will be histor an historic hand from Christina. Yes. So I'll take that as no questions, no further questions on that. Okay, thank you. Are we um, are we happy to agree the recommendations then? Could somebody just formally move it and second it, please, Chair? Yep, sorry, I'll, I'll um, move that. Do we have a seconder? I'll second it if uh, it's required. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. And everybody agrees. We'll take that as everyone agrees then. I think that's agreed by censure. Thank you, Vicky. So we can move on to um, agenda item eight, which is Hoylake Beach. And I've got Colin Clayton and David Armstrong to introduce this report. Colin and David. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, good evening, members. Um, I'll, I'll present the report of the May Chair and also accompanying me tonight, uh, I've got Neil Thomas, who's our Coastal Risk Manager and Technical Advisor, Anthony Beswick, who's the Area Manager um, for West Caribbean Hoylake and Christine Smythe, who's the local team leader. So once I've done the introduction, uh, if members have any questions, we, we hope to assist as a team. Uh, thank you. Um, so the report provides the committee with an update uh, on progressing future beach management options at Hoylake Beach following the executive member decision March 2020 to cease mechanical raking and herbicide spraying of vegetation. The decision was subject to call and, and the decision upheld following a meeting in August 2020. The report identifies the actions required to progress the recommendations of the original executive member's decision. In order to identify beach managing options that will not be detrimental to the conservation interests of the numerous environmental designations and to ensure future management options are sustainable, not only with regard to the change in nature of Hoylig Beach, but also with regard to the climate change and sea level rise, there needs to be a scientific evidence based base established against which various options can then be appraised. The report proposes a combined ecology and geomorphological study to provide this evidence base. A survey of the foreshore undertaken over growing season will establish the variety and extent of vegetation. This information can be used to inform the geomorphological study into how the beach has evolved and is likely to evolve in the future. 
Um, a draft specification has been used in soft market testing to establish a budget of projected at circa £30,000. Uh, we have inquired and the study would not be eligible for capital funding and in the original port, report advised that we'd need to fund this from existing budgets. Since the uh, publishing of the report, I can advise members that we've identified that this £30,000 could be um, could be uh, utilised from the Climate Emergency Fund. The report also proposes the production of a communication engagement strategy for the future beach management plan. The strategy will identify stakeholders and which elements of the beach management plan will be subject to engagement and which elements could be consulted on. The report requests that a working group comprised of the chair and the spokespersons are involved in the production of the strategy with officers. Finally, the report recommends that as the current assent for all management activities at Hoylake expires at the end of March 2021, an application for continuity, uh, continuation of assent for limited activities relating to sand clearance, highway drainage, and with regard to the community events is approved. Um, I hope that's acceptable as an introduction and happy to answer any questions if members have them, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Are there any questions or um, comments about this report? Councillor Rice has a hand up, Chair. Alison, you have your hand up. Thank you, yes. Um, could I just ask uh, Colin, thank you for that uh, report, um, Colin. Could, in the interest of uh, clarity, could you just sort of again outline um, what the objective, what objectives are for the scientific studies, you know, this geo and echo uh, scientific study that you've mentioned. Could you, in the interest of clarity, could you just briefly outline what are the objectives? What do you hope to achieve? I know you've gone into that, but could you, in the interest of clarity, could you just outline it for me, please? Yeah. Um, I, I the we, we we have paid uh, for statutory guidance uh, from natural england uh, on the basis of advising us what future ascent could potentially be after the ascent uh, expires in march 2021 within the uh, guidance document um, and report provided by natural england they said that this would be needed in order for us to set out our objectives so that 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 is the basis of the report. If I could ask, please, if it's okay with you, Chair, if whether Neil uh, would like to come in and make an additional comment on this, please. Yes, that's fine. Thank Neil. You. Neil. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Councillor Wright. So just coming into okay. that. So the, the 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 objectives of the ecology and geomorphological study will be to define exactly. Um, the extent and variety of uh, vegetation growth on the Hoylake foreshore. We need to know that because we need to know how that will respond to the geomorphological changes. So what I mean by that is the sediment that is driven into North Wirral from the North Wales coastline through natural processes, um, the type and the quantity of sediment will impact on how beach change will be formed will change, sorry. And of course, the vegetation on the beach is a driver for how that sediment can be trapped and how the foreshore will, foreshore will evolve in future. So it's really providing the evidence base and scientific understanding of what's happening due to the sediment that's coming in and the vegetation that is uh, starting to develop there. Right. Thank you. Could I ask another question, please? I do notice I'm not an expert, actually, as you probably realise. But just when I go down there, there is a lot of browning of the vegetation at the moment, which tells me that there's a lot of either dieback or there are grasses there that are not suitable for that environment, i.e. they're not saline resistant. So when you look across the bed of grass, there's a lot of dead grass there. Um, so it suggests that it, they're not in the natural habitat, you know, it's not working. But I suppose then 
the scientific study would look into all this, the different types you mentioned, um, and um, that's going to inform the decisions. And I understand that uh, Natural England would want a full, you know, um, look at this, you know, the scientific basis of evidence. Um, I, I just worry that, you know, if we're looking to extend this um, uh, agreement with um, Natural England uh, for another year, and I understand the rationale for that because you're wanting to consult and engage with residents um, and stakeholders, of course you do, um, And uh, I, but I'm just wondering if, I'm just concerned that it might be a deterioration in the habitat, you know, because at the moment there is extension, there is an extension of grass into the bird feeding area, for example, where the waders, you know, ten, I, I paced it out as a hundred steps out to the the far the area where, you know, flocks of birds collect in at appropriate times of the year, of course. And I'm just wondering if, if would there be, you know, do we close down all options, you know, in terms of management, if it's left while we just carry out studies and negotiate? I can understand why it's happening, but I just wonder if it's going to have a detrimental impact that can't be uh, pulled back, you know, cuts down options. Could you help me with that at all? Colin? Um. Okay, um, I, th I think first in, in terms of cutting back options, um, if, if required, you, you, could, you could clean the beach now. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing stopping. There's obviously be a lot of effort, in, um, it, but it could be done. If you don't mind, Councillor Wright and, and Chair, I, could I bring in Christine Smyth, who's the local team leader who knows the beach? I haven't been the beach for some time now, but Christine Smyth is, is obviously the local team leader and would have been there. Is it acceptable, Chair, if we bring in Christine for some comment, please? Yeah, can I just can I just um, clarify something though? It is absolutely vital that any discussion about Hoylake Beach sticks within the parameters of what um, of the scope outlined in the Natural England report, because at the end of the day, whatever is decided for, for the future beach management plan, it has to go back to Natural England. So if they've issued their guidelines about what is and is not permissible on that beach, um, any options uh, for management plans that we come up with do have to stick within that. Otherwise, it's just going to be rejected straight away. Um, but um, yes, thank, thank you very much, Colin. Yes, Christine. Yeah. Ch Chair, may I just comment there? I, I totally agree with you. I think within the report, it said that some localised vegetation removal might be acceptable, subject to the outcome of the ge ecological and geomorphical studies. I was just giving a, a kind of example that if required, you know, any any kind of um, any uh, flora that's kind of developed there, we, we could remove it as long as it does align and falls within uh, the, the, uh, the criteria set by Natural England Chair. Absolutely. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Colin. Um, so, yeah, sorry. Uh, Christine, are you okay? could you please comment on on um, the kind of um, the visual aspects that Councillor Wrights noticed there on on the beach in terms of the browning and and some kind of your general view, please. So is Christine Smythe? I think it's, can I just, Anna, is, she is on the line. I'm just checking, she was earlier, hang on a second. Thank you. I mean, these issues are going to be dealt with by the botanical survey, aren't they? Because Natural England wants both a geomorphological survey and a botanical survey. So any um, issues regarding um, the type of vegetation, the extent of vegetation growing on the beach um, and whether or not it is um, natural or not, that would be covered by the botanical survey, presumably, which would align with the geomorphological survey. Um, Absolutely. I, I'm sorry, Chair. Um, okay. Christine doesn't appear to be able to to come here. Near. I just thought it may be valuable to have a, a local a local knowledge because she would have actually been yeah. on the beach locally. So I'm sorry I can't assist further with them um, with that. Okay. Thank, thanks very much, Colin. Thanks, Alison. We'll presumably um, we'll be able to get back to you, and we'll obviously know uh, um, an awful lot more after we've had the surveys um, that the surveys completed. Yeah. Thanks, Colin. Um, yeah. has anybody I think Chair Councillor Cox has got his hand up and then Councillor Fouts has also indicated he'd like to speak. 
That's brilliant. Thanks, Vicky. Tony? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm probably going to be uh, digging up old ground is you can imagine. Um, right, first, first of all, uh, the Chair has just indicated there that um, the parameters, what we're going to talk about within the consultation effectively has to stay within the parameters. That, that that's, that's, can't happen is the first thing. Right? If we're going to consult people and we're genuinely going to ask them what they wish to see, if we're actually going to uh, have a true consultation, then we don't stick parameters on the consultation before we even start. Um, it will be far too easy for us, and it sounds like that's what we're going to do again, is to hide behind the idea that Natural England are just going to say no to everything. And, you know, if we haven't even put any alternatives to them um, in a, a positive and proactive way, rather than just accepting what we think they will say, then, of course, we already know the outcome to the consultation because it's done and dusted. And I've said this before um, to the chair and to uh, Colin and uh, during uh, uh, committee meetings and also during the calling. The one thing that we can't have in something that will be a once in a generation decision is for people to believe it's been a whitewash. And that's exactly what it's going to look like. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this again. Right? So I said it in the call and I'd still like to see it. We had a very convenient statement in the public statements from the gentleman who lives elsewhere in the Buddha, who was also really concerned about Hoylake, and uh, it's not it's not just a Hoylake issue. The point is, the people who it uh, affects the most, uh, regardless of what everyone else thinks in other areas, are the people of Mel's and Hoylake. As uh, simple as that, they are the people who have to look at it every day. They are the people who use it predominantly. Um, and they are the people who it affects mostly. Now, I would still like to see a carte blanche uh, as part of the consultation uh, involvement of all of the residents, basically from Bennett's Lane all the way up uh, to King's Gap, because they are the people it's going to affect uh, most. But also, rather than um, some of the people we've heard from in public questions, again, very conveniently, um, who I've got a sneaking suspicion I will know what their uh, uh, positions will be during the consultation. And I've no doubt that we will end up con consulting um, Hoylake Village Life in particular. So in the interest of balance, it's important that we have uh, uh, um, other um, interested parties actually uh, uh, engaged with too. Uh, too. So uh, uh, not just the general public, but other, other recognised um, properly constituted uh, groups such as Friends of Hoylake and uh, West Kirby Beaches and uh, newly constituted uh, Love Hoylake who may have slightly different opinions to uh, some of the people who we've already heard from. It's imperative that these people have actually engaged with during this consultation. So I, I uh, thank Colin for looking at this so um, thoroughly and actually recognising that it will need a true uh, and a proper consultation rather than something being pushed through um, before the end of this, uh, um, uh, the end of this agreement with Natural England now. So I recognise that that is the best way forward and I just want a confirmation that the, um, uh, the consultation process won't be a whitewash, please. Colin, again, before you start, um, just to refer to the opening comments by by councillor cox it, it is very important that we stick within the parameters of the law and natural england or the law on that beach so we can't go beyond what is legally permissible on that beach and nobody can you and i think you know that but colin if you can answer the rest of those questions please just to come back to you no i'm asking i'm saying that we can question what people wish to see whether it is beyond the law then clearly it could never happen if there are other the the, the we are expecting that Natural England's advice is going to be very different than the previous um, agreements over the previous five years. There has been some outlined Can guidance support, already. Support, there has been some outlined guidance already. Um, the point support. being that, that yeah. there needs to still be true consultation with the people who live in the area. Already said was that we cannot ask the people if they want something which we know is illegal. We just can't do that. We can only ask them uh, for, you know, options which we know are in, within the guidance that Natural England have given us. That That's the scope of what we can offer anybody who lives in that area. We can't. Well, we might as well put Hobson's oh. choice in the, in the debate then, because it's not a debate, is it? Okay. We can't offer people 
Um, but you did have other um, points to make. Um, Colin, did you want to come back on any of those points? Yeah, OK, thank you very much. Uh, there's, 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 there's two elements to the, the consultation engagement. Uh, within the specification we've set um, for the ge ecological and geomorphological study, we've asked that they engage with local residents in terms of identifying the key drivers of change for their. So that's the first part. And in the recommendation, because of the, the kind of passion and public interest uh, from very different views, this is why I've asked that we work with the chair and the spokes to help um, us as officers make sure we identify the right groups. And in, 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 in that, so we are inclusive, I think one of the, the kind of health checks here is that is the definition of the word engagement and consultation. I think we're quite open to engage with all with all members and all interests. I think what will be difficult is consulting. That's going to be the key element that I'd like to work through with the spokes and the chair, please, because it's quite clear if you look at the, um, the Natural England Guidance, it said, wide scale vegetation removal would not be acceptable. However, it then goes down to provide um, kind of further criteria. It said localised may be acceptable. Now, this 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 won't come out until we've completed the studies. And so we've got all the information we've got about invasive species, how the beach is going to change over time, how the ecology is going to change. So actually, Doing the early engagement is possible and we built this into the specification so we'll understand the key drivers from the local residents of what they want. Then we'll pull this together out the report and how the beach is likely to change. Weave this together with the Natural England report and then we'll be in a position to work out with the, with the, the members on what we can engage and what we can consult on. But at this time, I think it's, it's, it's just not possible to work out the kind of the, the very thin line between these two words because we, we purely can't consult on options that aren't going to be legal. However, what will be legal, we won't know until we've been through the studies and worked out through all the, the kind of data and information. It's a bit of a long winded answer, Chair, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it is of some assistance. No, that, that's very, very helpful. Thank you, Colin. Uh, we have got other questions. Um, but forgive me because the hands don't seem to mean anything on, on my particular device. Steve, do you have a question? Uh, well, if, if it's of any use, Chair, I, I've obviously been watching from afar and I've come back on, on the Environment Committee and uh, perhaps it might be worth just having some view. I mean, it, it appears to me that the our coastline, but it, the thing that makes Whittle Coastline interesting is the diversity of it. And it appears that some for some reason that a beach must forever be a beach or beaches don't have you know so if you think i'm just thinking about myself when i get on my bike and do do the coast and that and you start maybe up eastern way and it's very muddy and silty and there's all different types of things and you go around the coach and there's a bit of everything isn't it and, and i'm just wondering whether you know I'm not preempting any outcome for, for many, uh, any inquiry, but the the fact that we have such a diversity in itself is a is a is an asset, and something that needs needs a beach management plan across across the board and across the world. And this is a very controversial, is it not? Sort of sort of small part of what is a great great coastline. So I I, I see it much in that context, and it is a you know let's be honest, it, it is a whittle issue, but local opinion is always important. But it's like saying because Birkenhead Park's in my ward, I'm the only, I'm not the only person I should be listened to. So my view is that not only should we have a diversity of coastline, but we should have a diversity of views feeding into any decision making. And there's the other thing that I think people will demand because people will always say, uh, I don't like the, the phrase whitewash. It's not that it particularly uh, pleasant in a, in a public arena, but I certainly believe that people will be calling for any such study to be of an independent nature and truly independent nature. So we can feed that into any way forward. And I think the other thing that sort of raised, raised my eyebrows a bit um, is the cost, £30,000. Uh, we've all just been through the environmental budget process and it's tough. It's really tough. 
and £30,000 is a considerable amount of money uh, for, from the public purse that could be spent on other things that we are looking at to, to, to make savings on and, you know, make cuts on. So they, they, they're my general views, um, Chair, if it's helpful for, for the committee that, that whatever solution we come have should have, should, should embrace some diversity, diversity of membership um, and, and independence and be very, very mindful of the cost. £30,000, you know, in, in anybody's terms, our citizens are looking at us and we will be making decisions uh, that where £30,000 would make a difference between something being open and something being closed. So they're, they're, that's my opinion, Chair, and I'm, I'm happy to be on the committee and uh, ho always will try and make a contribution. Thanks, Steve. That's really helpful. And uh, I, I, I personally agree with what you're saying. Um, we have Helen next. I think Helen's got something to say. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, yes, firstly, thanks to uh, Colin and David for um, really trying to pick through this and not being um, pushed into any decisions, but make sure making sure that um, the approach is clear and the approach is transparent to to the consultation and the engagement. So I'm happy to note the progress developing the specification. I have one question about the specification, and that is, are we looking at um, what may happen long term and what a problem is short term, or is it all together in one? So the vegetation near the runoff from the prom, which could well be, you know, we've, we've had a lot of people furloughed, a lot of people working from home. There could be all kinds of weed and feed and patio cleaner and everything running off um, this year in particular um, into that. Um, the vegetation there, I'm, I'm, I assume that's being looked at at the same time as vegetation that we may well be establishing as a new native species. So it's more about, can you clarify the specification for me on uh, current drainage issues that need resolving and long term what shape the beach may take? Um, and, and then uh, just on the other issue about the extension, we're in December and um, uh, Alison Wright brought <coughs> this um, onto the work programme earlier to try and make this happen. Why in December do we have to make a decision on an extension to something that uh, finishes in March 2021? Why is it now we're as having to ask for an extension on something um, foresight's great, but um, it's unusual in some respects. Okay. Thanks, uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to attempt to answer the questions uh, of a May, and then I'll ask my colleagues where I've um, where I've got any deficiencies. In, in terms of, uh, you, you, you're quite correct. The ecological study uh, will look at all the flora that's developed there. And it will identify as that which species would be part of natural succession and which ones were, are invasive species and make some recommendations. And that aligns very much um, with, with the report from Natural England in saying that some localised vegetation removal may be appropriate depending on the study. Um, so that, that, will, that will kind of shape up what vegetation management may be possible localised. Uh, the study is then to really to set out what the succession would likely to be with the change in accretion of the sand and work out what the long, long term uh, changes on the beach will be depending on a number of kind of models. So eventually we'll be bringing back to members a predicted model of how the ecology will change and how the sand, so how it will potentially look is the is the kind of aspiration of doing this work. Um, there was, there is, could you just re remind me um, on the third point to do with the drains, please? Yeah. Councillor Sorry, that, that's, that's fine on the drainage, that clears it up for me. So they will look at all that vegetation, yeah. but the purpose of the study is to really demonstrate to us what the beach may look like, like over the next, you know, 30, 50 years. That's that's the purpose of the study. Yeah. But of course, in, when they gather the evidence, they'll gather everything around the drains, I assume. So so that, that answers that one. The other point was only about the um, the extension to the ascent from National Union. I don't I don't understand. So the work, the original work programme didn't even have beach management on it um, until we, we, we brought it forward to December because of the timings around this. 
And then, of course, added in then is, well, let's ask for the extension now. And it's the, the contract runs to March 2021. The ascent sorry, runs to March 2021. So I just want to know, where's the urgency in December to try and agree uh, to extend this? Um, because I'm still hoping to see some urgency, particularly from maybe the public and the public questions. I'm, I'm looking to see some urgency on this drainage issue and the ecology around that. Um. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. Um, my understanding is that after, as we started working on this project and doing the planning ahead, that for us to do the specification, we needed to build in a full growing season for the survey to take place. Um, Neil, could you could you add to that, please? Because you drafted the specification. Or if Christine's there, please. Is that acceptable, please, Chair? Yes. Yes, that's great. Yeah. That's fine. I mean, um, Colin's right. We need we need to understand what grows from um, the start of the spring all the way through to the summer because different types of uh, vegetation grow at different times. But I think the question was really about why do we need to look for the continuation of ascent? Why do we need approval to do that now rather than waiting uh, until March? And the answer to that is that we need to um, consult with Natural England and that takes time. Um, and so that we need to be in a position at the end of March, beginning of April, where if we do need to undertake any activities on the beach, we can do so legally um, because from April the 1st, 2021, uh, we won't be allowed to legally undertake any work on the, on the foreshore at all. OK, thank you. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Colin. Uh, uh, Chair, I'm aware that you can't see all the hands, but I think David wanted to come in on that oh. point. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Chair. OK, thanks. David? David, D did you want to say something? He's just left by the looks of it. Oh no. Right. Maybe David can come back in and, and talk to us if he, if he wanted to say something. Um, I can't, um, I think Alison was the next person on, on my list, but I could be completely mistaken because the hands are a bit random. Alison, did you have something to say? Uh, yes, I did actually. Uh, just to echo really some of the points that people have been making, I think it's absolutely vital that any study that's conducted there is from an independent specialist and so that it's a completely um, in the interest of neutrality really and also the engagement and consultation as has been said uh, Hoylake and Mel's residents as well as interest groups, beach interest groups as well, is so important here. Uh, so that's, I just wanted to make that statement really, but I think people agree with that anyway. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Um, were there any other questions? I think Councillor Cook's got his hand up, Chair, and I think David Armstrong might have rejoined the meeting now. Councillor Cook, do you want to go? Go next. Yes, very briefly. I'd just like to come back to the issue of cost again. Um, now, Council Wright made this point, um, very valid point, about striving for uh, impartiality. Um, now, uh, I would have thought that, you know, uh, we're more likely to get this from an academic source. Acc accredited academics have already proved themselves in doing studies, you know, similar studies in other parts of the country, uh, than, than going out to, to you know, commercial uh, companies who are doing it for profit for tens of thousands of pounds. You know, I would have thought that we'd be, our interest would be best served in terms of impartiality and um, cost saving uh, to approach accredited academics for this study if it has to actually take place. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. Did, did you want me to comment on that? Sorry, Chair. I was waiting. I thought you were about to comment. Sorry, yeah. Chair. So, sorry, Chair. Um, I think we, we've done the soft market testing, uh, Councillor Cook, which has identified the market rate for this work would be about £30,000, um, which which requires that we must follow the procurement process. It's CPR number nine. But what I would say is that once it's on the chest, I think we'd welcome um, academic authorities and, and other individuals to, to kind of a, a apply or bid for this but it's important that they do um, 
meet the criteria set under the procurement rules so there's indemnity and insurance but i think we'd we'd widely welcome academic uh, institutes applying to bid for this work but it must go through the chest to make sure it's compliant with our procurement and uh, processes thank you councillor cook thank you Colin. thanks Colin. um david did you want to say something at this point yeah just just a couple of points, Chair. I won't put the camera on because that locked me out last time. Just a couple of points for Councillor Cameron. She's right in, in about the drainage. When the prom was built in 1890s, um, the drainage from the road goes through the promenade wall and onto the beach. And a number of residents have raised concerns that they think water from the general wastewater system is finding its way onto the beach, particularly around the old toilet block area. We have discussed that with the United Utilities more than once, and they have checked the drainage. And to date, they haven't found any leakage from the general wastewater system into the drainage system that just serves the highway promenade. Clearly, that will get picked up on the survey as to the types of growth that are being sustained there. And we will carry on liaising with United Utilities. Neil is beginning discussions with the Environment Agency about a long-term scheme, and we are talking about five or six years hence, which would, inc which would incorporate sorting out the promenade drainage as part of a bigger scheme. But for the moment, we have explored it with United Utilities, and nothing has shown yet that the only water which finds its way onto the beach is through the highway drainage system off the prom and as was alluded to earlier um many of those outlets get blocked by the sand up against the wall and then when we flush them out and we suck the water out we don't actually pump water into them to flush them out but inevitably we have to use some water to suck the sand out which is blown in off the, off the beach and when we do that the dirty water does find its way through and i know that upsets some people and we're going to try and find a better way of keeping the drains sand free because it's the residents who live on the front clearly they can end up with two meters of water in the gutter so we have to keep trying to do that um, we, we we need to talk to natural England because the approval letter they give us also applies to other beaches to West Kirby and New Brighton and it allows us to litter rake and clearly we do want to be able to to do that so th that's another reason why we need to have that debate and seek the year's extension on the current on the current permissions thank you thanks David um, are there any other um, questions or comments Vicky. I can't oh. see any other hands up, Chair. Right. Thank you very much for that. I think that, that it's quite clear there's there's a, a lot of um, there's a lot of agreement basically and, and I suspect both sides of the beach argument are are in agreement over most issues. Um, certainly the need for independent studies um, and I think that that's really important and the desire is obvious amongst the committee members for um, thorough oversight over, over this particular issue um, um, throughout. Uh, with, with, um, with that in mind, Christina, did you have something to say? Christina, it's, I've, got, I've got hands up for four people here. I'm just checking that there aren't any hands up on other people's devices. Chair, um, I sent some, um, I was waiting really till we, we got to the recommendations, but right. I've got some amendments to the recommendations which are sent to you, I'm yeah. hoping you've got them, um, which I, I would actually prefer if you could read out, because by this time of night, having looking at this little screen, my eyesight is really hopeless, and you'd have to see me looking through a huge light looking glass to see you all. Um, so. That's why I sent them to you, but I, 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 very nothing major, but just some changes. I think to to kind of neaten it all up, really. To bring together, okay. Um, can can I can I read these out then? The the um, and can you correct me, Christina, if if um, if you're not hearing things um, as they should be? Um, um, I believe that we can put a copy. Can we put a copy on the chat? <laughs> I'll read them out anyway. It says that we, I mean, the Labour group are quite happy with this um, report. We're, we're happy with the work that the officers have put in. We share sharing concerns with the um, with all the members who've been speaking about the cost of the surveys, the sheer cost of the surveys, um, and it, and and also the degree of oversight that the committee will have um, over the procurement of, of the surveys and over the um, engagement with, with um, stakeholders. So. Um, the, there, there are proposed amendments, and the proposed amendment to recommendation one 
is, if I read it out in full, note the progress in developing a specification for an ecological and geomorphological survey and, subject to a suitable budget being identified in consultation with the Environment, Climate, Emergency and Transport Committee to agree to the procurement of independent studies as a scientific evidence base upon which to develop future management options for Hoy Lake Beach. And then the second um, recommendation was amended to agree that the Director of Neighbourhoods produces a communications and engagement strategy for the development of the beach management plan for Hoylake in consultation with a politically proportionate working group of the committee. And a third one is that to approve the, sub the submission of an extension request for assent to Natural England for the continuation of non-vegetation management activities at Hoylake Beach, which were not subject to cessation as a result of the Cabinet Member decision of 13th of March 2020, subject to clear specification of these activities and agreement with the committee, and that all such activities be publicised and local councillors and this committee be notified at least a week in advance of any such planned activities. So nothing too drastic there, I don't think. And I, I, I'm, I'm guessing from um, previous comments that there should be support for that. Are there any? Oh. Um, Sorry, I found it now. Um, yes, that's right. OK. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Christina. Do we have a seconder for that? Sorry, can I just ask a question about the amendment? Thanks, Steve. Helen? Um, so obviously we can see uh, the amendment and I think another member mentioned budget before um, and uh, I thought we had in the budget workshop discussed a lot of the proposed savings but a, but a subject came up um, that I hadn't heard of before which is a separate budget to do with climate emergency. So um, I think I don't want to if it's not public, I wouldn't want to say the actual amount, but um, it's it well exceeds um, this request. So what's the problem? Is that ring fence for something? What's the problem with this other pot that um, I understand you have? What's the problem with that not paying for this study, considering it's so important to shape the consultation and to make sure everything's done right? Thanks, Helen. My understanding is that that pot of money is is already within the um, the committee this area um it's, it's within our budget um the neighborhood's budget already and it's a, a, quite a significant amount of that is allocate is, is is due to be spent on the tree team um as part of our tree strategy which was um part of our response to the climate emergency um and it we we feel quite strongly that it would be a shame to at this point when we are really squeezing the budget as much as possible because of the constraints um, that, that, but that all councils are going through at the moment. Uh, we just don't want to waste any money at all. Uh, if it's if it's possible to to keep that climate fund. Yeah, for, I think, for, I think for, agree. For Nobody us. wants to waste any money. But yeah, exactly. uh, I wasn't sure if some of your members knew that you had this um, aside and ring fence because um, you know there's much bigger numbers being discussed at workshops when yeah, that, when people yeah. you know look at them and uh, there was a level of concern about this just making sure that they knew you had um, some aside as well. Thanks, Thanks. Well, that's really useful. I mean, apart from the, I think everybody does know, and it is yeah. public, it's in the public realm because it was actually announced. I think we did a press release about it. So yeah. it is widely known there are, that all residents um, who, who read the, the, the local press would be aware of that because it was it was announced that we were, um, uh, you know, we'd, we'd released this, this sum of money as part of our response to the climate emergency, following our declaration of, of the climate emergency. So it's well and truly in the public realm, but it's good to know that you've, you've, you've heard about it too now. Um, so going back to the um, the, most, the the amendment proposed by Christina and seconded by Steve, it's probably worth um, going for a vote. Is that okay, Vicky? Yes, Chair, that's fine. There's, no, there's nobody. Okay, we'll move to a vote on that. Councillor Berry. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, I'm against that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Cameron. Uh, 
I'm for in the uh, revised date. I'm for this because we've always asked for proper consultation. Okay. Councillor Cook. For. Councillor Cox. For. Councillor Corkill. For. Councillor Gray. For. Councillor Fawkes. Steve, you're on mute. We didn't we didn't hear that. Councillor Fawkes. I do apologise, Councillor Fawkes for. Councillor Muspratt. For. Councillor Norbury. For. For. Councillor Williams. For. And Councillor Ooh. Wright. For. I think that is carried, Chair. Ten for one against. Carried. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vicky. Thanks, everybody. So if we, we can move on now to um, item number nine, which is the update on the exercise to trial alternatives to glyphosate in the use of weed control. And is it Colin or Mike? Um, I'll cover this, please, Chair. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Colin. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, no problem. Um, I, I'm on my own tonight. Uh, I've been working with Neil before I do the report with Neil Garnett, who's the operational manager who's been doing all the trials. I um, unfortunately couldn't make it tonight uh, in case members had any kind of technical or more detailed questions. But I will endeavour once I've delivered the introduction to, to assist you. And I've been working very closely on this. So I'm, I'm, I'm fairly familiar, but I may be short of some of the detail. Um, this report provides a community with an update and overview of the current position regarding the trials, the final alternative methods of weed control. Uh, the council has historically used glyphosate under license for weed control across the authority. However, in response to the recommendations of the Environment Overview and Scrutiny Committee in November 2019, yeah. officers have conducted a series of exercises to trial alternative methods of weed control. The report provides an overview of the trials undertaken and the findings identified for each alternative method. As part of this work, um, th as part of this work, the report details the work officers who participated in a peer survey uh, survey with APSI, which is the Association of Public sector excellence. Um, we arranged several alternative trial demonstrations of non-chemical weed control, including thermal treatment via propane fired burner, mechanical scrubbing um, using a rotating nylon discs attached to power units. And in the report, we've also detailed the work undertaken by our contractor, Man Coed, who at the request of our officers trialled a number of alternative methods, including 20% uh, acetic acid and the manual removal of weeds across the sites, uh, across the borough. Uh, within the report, we've described the evidence from the work undertaken so far has clearly indicated that unfortunately alternative weed control methods trialled are less productive and effective, and to date, we've not been able to find an acceptable alternative to the use of glyphosate. However, I think a kind of positive news, table one of the report provides evidence that the use of glyphosate by World Council over the last 12 months has been reduced by 50%. Although I would note that some consideration must be given to the six week period that we suspended um, all week treatments during the COVID pandemic. Um, the, 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 it's certainly from uh, in the parks, this is largely credited um, to the policy we introduced last year of no glyphosate except to use some of the more uh, invasive species such as Japanese knotweed. Uh, we conclude the report that we'll continue to seek alternative methods of weed control um, and we're liaising with our local authority peers and industry experts. However, the continuing use of glyphosate is the only practical and sustainable method is required for at least the short term to medium term. Uh, I hope that's acceptable, Chair, as an introduction and I'll, I'll endeavour to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. That's great. Um, are there any questions from members? Councillor Norbury has his hand up, Chair. Thanks, Vicky. Tony? Hi, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware that um, other countries have, have banned uh, glyphosate um, comprehensively, you know, completely banned it. And um, I'm just referring to the alternatives that Colin talks about and the trials of the alternatives. 
have we benchmarked um, our alternatives against alternatives from other countries, maybe with similar climates to, to our own? Because, um, you know, th this is a, a poisonous chemical that's been banned in, in, in many, many countries. And, and I'm sure we're moving towards um, a, a similar thing in, in this country because uh, we don't want to be poisoning people uh, and species and the environment. So, uh, you know, is that any of that being taken into consideration? Or are all these other countries absolutely um, piled under with weeds? Uh, thank you, Councillor Norbury, uh, through you, Chair. Um, the, the, the benchmarking we've done is through APSI, which is our kind of peer uh, association of public centre excellence. Um, I think attached into the report is some of the work we've done. Um, so being absolutely straight and candid with you, no, we've not looked internationally um, at kind of our peers. Uh, the work has been done exclusively through APSI as, as the kind of um, the, the generally accepted uh, benchmarking peer-to-peer -peer checking um, for local authorities. Um, if you would kindly send me any of the information you've got that would assist, I'd, I'd be happy to try to explore this further. Uh, we can even feed it into the APSI. Um, you know, we're, we're members of APSI, so we could even submit this type of information into them to see if we could get any feedback from our colleagues and peers, if, if that would help. Thank you. Happy to do that, Carl. I won't charge you £30,000 for it either. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very kind. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Tony. Um, are there any other questions? Chris, have you got your hand up? Chris Chris Cook? Yes. Yeah, yes, I have, actually. Um, yeah, I appreciate the detailed report on uh, on use of glyphosate and peer reports from other uh, council officers grappling with the problem, uh, some particularly interesting ones. I mean, clearly, uh, other councils have had difficulty in finding suitable alternatives. Um, one particularly interesting one is uh, by an officer in... Swansea City and Council, um, who, who who signals the problems of using um, various types of heat treatments, uh, because of course that has implications for um, uh, biodiversity as well. You know, even insects. We might laugh when we talk about poor insects perishing, you know, under, under heat treatment and so on. But I mean, they are the, you know, an important level, aren't they, in the, in the biosphere and so on. Um, Although this the, the, this particular council officer seems to be kind of implicitly arguing the case for keeping glyphosate on, which I think is is, is unacceptable. Um, there are references in the report to to um, you know strict standards in the way that glyphosate is applied. Now it's very interesting that um, I've had a few residents uh, who've been concerned uh, to see um, uh, people applying glyphosate in their view without the necessary protective gear you know, the PPI, um, and perhaps not spraying it very, very accurately. Uh, so I think, you know, given that alternative um, treatments for weeds don't seem to be satisfactory, glyphosate's unacceptable because it is poisonous. Um, I'd like to see encouraged a, a real alternative, which is community involvement, you know, community engagement. I know this has been mooted by um, uh, this committee uh, last year before the change of governance. And... Um, I appreciate in, in the council's report, you know, that, that one of the downsides of that is inexperience on the part of potential uh, volunteer groups of local residents. But I mean, you know, you only get the experience, don't you, by uh, by, by um, um, engaging in the first place, and practice makes perfect. So that's something I'd like to. Uh, I hope it doesn't sound too naive, but I think there is real mileage in that. You know, getting local residents involved um, and perhaps. Uh, helping clear weeds, particularly where they feel that they're most uh, dangerous, you know, like between paving stones, you know, I mean, some weeds can probably be left, you know, uh, roadsides where, where they're not a tripping danger. But I'm sure if you've got teams of residents uh, involved themselves, they'd be prioritising where the weeds really need to be removed, um, using old fashioned traditional means, you know, between pavings and so on. Um, so that's something I, I, I would like to see and promote that if, if there's mileage for that. Um, I'd like to, council officers to give consideration to that approach. Thank you. Uh, uh, may I answer, Chair? Um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your feedback. With regard to the, we spent a lot of time with the contractor um, last year, um, working through quite a number of complaints similar to what you said about the how they were applying it, some health and safety issues. 
and I, I, I'm really pleased with the improvement um, in this. We, we, we built it into the contract specification. We built it into the contract management meetings. We have a separate agenda where we go through complaints and health and safety issues. And the number has definitely dropped this year. What I would welcome is any of these reports about where they're not applying it properly or you're concerned about them not using PPE. If they just send them directly to me, we'll raise them the um, the contract manager has been really responsive um, to to any complaints and they've investigated them thoroughly so I'd welcome that in terms of engaging the local community uh, we did do some work uh, with some volunteers in New Brighton um, I've got to be honest with you it was it was quite challenging um, we had to work through our, our kind of risk management uh, we had to work through our, our corporate health and safety. We had to work with our highways colleagues uh, in terms of drafting some uh, general kind of rules and uh, rules and protocols and risk assessments. But Neil Garnett led this. It was quite successful. We, we did actually have a little bit of um, coverage in the media. Um, and I, I think we, we could expand this, but realistically, because of the thousands of mile kilometres we've got across the borough, I think it's good for communities. I think it's good for local communities and I'd, I'd welcome it. Um, we, we don't have the resources to expand it massively. It is quite intensive in terms of the engagement and working out who wants to do this. And we have to do some training to make sure they're aware that you know, you can't leave tools at the side of the road. You've got to you've got to apply the the kind of hose and things so you don't damage the infrastructure. So it's quite a bit of work. And but Neil worked really really hard with some um, local volunteers in New Brighton. It was really well received, and I think they actually enjoyed and felt felt pride in it. Uh, but it would be quite a difficult scheme to expand beyond the small number. Um, I'm happy to kind of discuss it further, answer any further questions, but that's the kind of feedback, Councillor Cook. Thanks, thanks Colin. Yeah. So thanks, I can just come back on that briefly. Again, thanks, Colin, for correcting me on my use of PPI. It shows I've been brainwashed by the uh, decades of um, adverts about that. It's PPE, of course, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Personal protective equipment, yeah. Um, yeah, I, and that, that is an issue I didn't point out, I didn't specify, but of course the potential for, for, for saving money for the council as well. You know, I mean, it might cost a little bit of money trying to engage um, community groups, but I think we've got to believe that this can that this can work. You know, it might have modest beginnings, but I think once it catches on, it'll capture people's imagination, getting the community involved. And there's a benefit of the social aspect of it too, isn't there? You know, and people sort of um, regaining sort of ownership of their of their neighbourhoods you know this is this is another thing too I think residents are so often coming to us walkouts are saying you know the council's done this you know they've, they've brought these big uh, vehicles in and damaged the grass verges and they've not told us they're going to do this and that sort of thing you know and the other issue I have I think really is with uh, perhaps as a trust deficit uh, with regard to man co-ed you know that are doing this glyphosate treatments and, and that extends to other things like for example tree felling you know which seems to be um, overzealous at times I had an example of that in my ward you know recently where a tree with a bit of a hole at the base hollowing out w w was felled within a week you know I wish we could get the same rapid action on other things you know like road safety and um, and street lights for example um, but you know so so um, that's an issue I think you know uh, that the, the, the company that's doing this uh it, i think is has been losing trust uh, among certain sectors of the community those particularly concerned with uh biodiversity you know and environmental um, um issues as well yeah okay thank you thanks chris and um, to go back to that to the point about the new brighton um trial with volunteers um i actually took part in that in that that, um, that volunteer um meeting and the the benefits for, for volunteers taking part in that were really apparent. Um, it was a really um, fun event. People people really appreciated and understood just how much effort officers had put into uh, enabling um, that. Colin and the team had worked really hard. Neil uh, had worked really hard facilitating that. And I think it would be just sort of teething troubles, really, initially, um, the costs and, and the effort. I think it would get easier over time. But it, it was it, a lot of effort did go into it, but it was a, a very, very successful event. So, yeah, thank you for that, Colin. Um, thank you, Chair. Any, any other questions? Christina, have you got a question? Yes. Um, and, and a view. Um, I think in times gone by, 
when we read our history books, we, we hear that people used things that killed them. Um, I know my husband's family, the Musprats, who made chemicals, managed to kill St. Helens and Flincher. Um, but people would have said, oh, well, we need the chemicals. And it sounds a little bit like that over uh, the uh, glyphosate, because we shouldn't be saying we haven't got an alternative, so we've got to use them. We should be saying we can't use them, so we have to find an alternative. Um, because they just are going to be banned anyway. I think America will end up being one of the few countries that uses them. And in your paperwork, it did say that um, I think it was continental Europe have banned them and they use vinegar. Um, and you've been concerned about the smell. So I think knowing people who live in continental Europe, I think I might ask them, have they noticed the smell? Because it is a particularly pungent smell of vinegar, isn't it? So, but I think that is an interesting um, thing that we should be looking at. And also we've got the other, um, and I don't know how you pronounce it, and, and I'll tell you how you spell it, as far as I remember, P-E-L-A-R-G-O-N-I-C is what's on some of the things that they tell you you can use. Now, have we tried that, or is that not working either? Uh, and also, going to, over to the people in New Brighton, I think that's fabulous. If you remember, Colin, I wrote to you um, yeah. because they've been in touch with me about it. And I think it's great that you've done all the work because now that hard work has been done. It can be rolled out, can't it? It would be a shame to waste all that hard work if we didn't roll it out. And on the training, would it be possible for us to run training sessions for trainers so that every group had somebody who could train new volunteers in it? A bit like the, the friends of the parks with the certain things we have to do, go on training about and 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 mayor hall where we have to go on fire training and things like that because then it would just need an oversee wouldn't it and a tick because people are very very keen to do this and a lot of places don't want the spraying in in bebbington ward i get more about the, the problems of spraying than i do about the problems of the weeds um so you know, we've got to look at all sides on this i know but i do feel um a i'd like the answer on the pel chemical um i'd like to know what what did happen with with the vinegar you said it didn't work for very long but it, none, none of the surface weed killers will do for long it's only those that go into the root of the work aren't they and 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 also um, can we can we roll out if, if uh, people want to do it because it was a good exercise and it was a good more than anything it was a good community exercise and that's the important thing isn't it that in a time when that was going on where we were sort of almost at our lowest a group of people had a real good time socially distancing but still managing to clear the weeds yeah uh, thank you, Councillor Muspratt, uh, Chair. So in, in terms of um, trainer for trainer, I think Neil actually enjoyed it as well. And I think he'd be keen to get involved. Obviously, is, is times uh, difficult if we had a, a deluge or a large number, but I, I think it, it's a good idea and we could slowly build this up. Um, Neil, and, and, and again, picking up on your idea of if we could get some community champions here, who would be happy to be uh, trainers. Obviously, I think as the COVID situation um, changes, this would make it more practical as well. In terms of the acetic acid, um, I, I saw the photographs and I had a few discussions with Neil and Man Coed. Uh, what, what they did is they, they had a, a patch of grass and weeds and we sprayed it you know, um, with some with acetic acid, some with glyphosate, um, and I think they tried something else. Um, it, it wasn't it wasn't really successful but one of the problems was was the regrowth it, it, it just didn't you know with glyphosate um you, you, you do get regrowth and we get a lot of complaints i mean I, I, I we've had an awful lot of complaints this year thousands it may, i don't know the exact number about the weed growth across the borough so that that would be a concern then to me I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely with you members have made it clear they want glyphosate phased out we as officers are doing our best to work towards that. 
uh, and, I, and I would like to make that happen and we won't we won't stop until we've you know we've until we've we've delivered for you uh, the acetic acid it was the I wasn't there because I only saw photographs but they said it absolutely stunk it was really really unpleasant and that was in one uh, one trial area so we've we, we ended up spraying thousands of gallons across the borough I, I, I'm not sure unless we could do something or a product that was less pungent. I think we'd have quite a few complaints and then we'd have the regrowth problems as well. Um, I, I didn't quite get the, the spelling, but if, if I can have this out, the Pella, um, the, 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 the product you said, I, I will check whether we've used it or not. And if not, I'll put it on the list for trials, Councillor Musbrat. Is that acceptable? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Colin. Um, th thanks, Christina, for that question. Uh, Steve, you have you've got a comment. Chair, I don't obviously don't want to along what's what's been a, a really good and long but long night. Um, the 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 thing the, the thing with the the alternatives it, it could be self defeating if we were to rush into an alternative that was not effective. Um, then the clamour for the old way that works would get to quite a crescendo so my view is that you you explain to the public the journey we're on uh, and you know explain that we are reducing the amount and we are desperately looking for a safer alternative and when that is available then we you know we will reach our, our goal which is to to eradicate the, this chemical and, and i think christina was right i think legislation will will lead the way we'll have to do something whether it's uh, but the demand for weed control will not go away from our public. And when we talk about public ownership, that's quite quite good in, you know, smaller local areas, but our sort of main gateway areas, as soon, soon as they start to get this high weed growth, and, and Colin was right, I was inundated with uh, complaints, and I know other councils were, and they demand some sort of reaction. But, uh, you know, we are on the journey. Where, where, it, where it is successful, um, and we've had some success in our area, you know, the people getting the back entries and using them as useful spaces, but what they demand first, they actually demand you get it clean and then they keep it clean. So initially the need, the, 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 the demand is to get something that's effective for a one-off. And I think that might be another phase of the programme. If we, could, we have a deal with the public and say, look, we're going to use this, treatments as bad as it is we're going to use it maybe the once and then over to you community it's clear you keep it clear so you know every i think it was alluded to but every house like goes out and does their own front pavements once it's clean or keeps it clean it's manageable and controllable but if you don't get it right then then and don't take the public with you then the backlash forces you to probably end up using more of this stuff so it's a fine fine balancing act but i think we're united as a committee i hope that we are desperately seeking to eradicate this chemical from our environment and, and i think we're making progress but we're not there yet thanks steve colin did you want to come back on that uh, no i i you know i accept those comments I, you know i i do genuinely want to serve the uh, the committee and make sure we find an alternative um, but it, it's it's been a really really challenging year uh, in, in in the sheer number of complaints and i think it was exacerbated with the um, the grass cutting uh, stoppages as well so it, it's been a really challenging year in kind of um delivering for our public who've been a, a, a little bit disappointed i think with the maintenance of both the grass cutting and weeds um i, I think there is there is reasons but we need to make sure that we do deliver what a lot and a lot of our residents want which is you know clear pathways and and weeds but uh, i support all, all the comments made tonight and we will do our best uh, we'll continue with these trials and and expand the kind of community program as this comes through we'll um, we'll look to try and support our communities who, who want to do this work thank you thanks colin i, th I think it is important to acknowledge that um COVID may have been in, um, part of this, but there has been, uh, according to the report, a 50% reduction in glyphosate use um, in the last 12 months. Uh, so that there really has been progress made, and there certainly, you know, there certainly has been um, a lot of effort put into trialing alternatives. Uh, I know that because I've been to some of the trials, so I, I do know that this has been going on even during the the year of COVID and a really really challenging time, which um, which Colin has alluded to. So I think I think we can all appreciate that. Thanks, Colin. 
also worth noting that it, it is important to remind ourselves that the um, current EU um, guidance on, on, on glyphosate runs out in 2022 and would be up for renewal uh, and that you know we don't know where we're going to be um, when that happens and that, that there are as, as a few people have pointed out I think um, Tony Tony pointed this out and Christina there are there are a number of countries that have already um, said that they're going to ban they're already phasing out or have already banned glyphosate and although I think the federal government still allows it in America but at a city and state level it's it's banned across America um, uh, locally um, and, and across the Canada parts of Australia have banned it it is increasingly um, being considered um, something that's got to be phased out and I think it's important also to remind ourselves that the World Health Organization has declared glyphosate a known human carcinogen that shouldn't be used. And that's the World Health Organization. So the work that, um, you know, Neil and Colin and the team have been, have been doing on this, this is this is really important work. And, and I, I really appreciate all the effort that's been put in in all these different ways to try and reduce and eventually eliminate glyphosate use on the world. Uh, it's a very, very important piece of work. Thank you. Does anybody have any any other questions or comments? I think Councillor Cox has his hand up, Chair. Thanks. Tony, you've got a, a comment or a question? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I'd just like to say Steve Fawkes, the voice of reason. Um, I don't think anyone on this committee, uh, and I, 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 if I recall rightly, I think we unanimously voted to um, phase out glyphosate at, uh, in a notice of motion, which some on here are very keen to actually quote. Um, I, I, th I think it went through unanimously. I think I'm right in saying that. But the word here is, is phase out. Uh, it, it's not guillotine. And I've used that before, uh, Chair, as you'll know, with regards to the beach. Um, but it, it, if, if we have found a, a valid alternative, then I would be singing the phrases now and looking to get rid of glyphosate immediately. And the enjoyable event that was referred to uh, it sounds like a great community uh, a great for community cohesion i'm sure it was enjoyable i'm sure the volunteers enjoyed it um but something that we we tend to do or i tend to hear rather from from members is we like to quote um experts and we like to uh, quote officers uh, as uh, an officer's reports as often as we can but um, the officer, uh, 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 Colin Clayton, has just said that um, effectively it's not scalable. The, the idea of the uh, great community event to dig up the thousands and thousands of miles of highway that we have in the Whittle, it's not scalable. It's not actually reasonable. Now, uh, uh, Chris, Chris came in before and you know we said glyphosate's not acceptable and all the others don't work so we have to look at manually removing them that's all well and good but when he came back in with his, with a supplementary uh, quote um uh, and points it, he skipped over the fact that uh, collins just said it's not scalable it's not actually feasible so we need to listen to the experts to the officers as we like to do with other issues so my my, my suggestion will be we need to carry on looking for that viable alternative um as Steve said before, it's, it is commendable that we are reducing it. We are on a journey, as he put it, into uh, using zero glyphosate. But unfortunately, at the minute, we don't. I, I don't believe we've got a choice to uh, uh, to actually eradicate it immediately. We just need to move towards reducing it and look for that um, silver bullet, if you like. But it's not there at the minute, and we need to recognise that rather than having our fingers in our ears and pretending that the manual uh, weeding is something that's going to actually take over, because it, it clearly isn't. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. I think I think people are pretty much in agreement um, with you, Tony, that um, we're not there yet, but we are moving in the right direction and that um, Neil's team has worked really, really hard on this. Um, and I think those people that advocated for better, greater communication, I think, um, is probably the way forward. If something, you know, is temporarily quite smelly like vinegar, then we would certainly need to tell people why we were doing that. And then if we told them that the alternative um, was potentially very dangerous uh, and a bit banned across the world. They might be on board with a, a temporary inconvenience of, of smelly vinegar. The, the only I, one thing I would say to you is, with regards to the acid that people have uh, um, recognised, I've actually instead of using glyphosate this year on my own property, I've actually used that acid. Um, 
you need a mask on if you're using it because it is horrific. Um, it, it literally, you can taste it on the back of your throat and your eyes, uh, feel like the watering. So I would suggest uh, caution with using that as well, actually. Sounds potent. OK, thanks, Tony. Thank you for that. Thanks, Colin. Um, that, that's a really, really useful report for us. Um, I think it's unless there's any more comments, we'll look at the recommendations. Are there any more comments or questions? Just, yeah, so I just wanted to make one quick point. Uh, you know, we have to remember about weeds, don't we? You know, that um, weeds are subjective in a sense, aren't they? You know, it's basically herbs, first types of grass growing where we don't want them. And I think we need to make the distinction uh, of where weeds need to be removed because they are a hazard and where residents, you know, uh, want them removed because of aesthetic reasons, you know, and I don't think it's acceptable. And they would probably understand if they understood the full implications of glyphosate, that if it's a choice between risking their health and their pets and, you know, biodiversity and everything else, um, and, uh, you know, uh, carrying with glyphosate, um, I think I think they would they would rather put up with a certain number of weeds in places where they weren't hazardous you know and uh and, and benefit from the uh the health advantages of that yeah thanks chris colin did you have something to say yeah i i think that's an interesting point um that council cook's made and, and and i'm just i'm just trying to work it through there you know whether there is you know standards to be set here at the moment i i get complaints if there's any weeds but I think if, if certain communities would accept, I'm just accept higher levels of weed, then we could spray it less or not treat it. But there is some, obviously we've got to consider the infrastructure and it need to be, we'd have to work these things through with people like Simon Fox, because if, you know, if we just leave um, weeds to grow through tarmac, it's going to damage it and things. But I don't know whether that, there's, that we could develop this in terms of our thinking about certain areas um I, I i but i think there's a lot more work to go here chair but i think it's just as as a principle of almost you know you know a key area lower 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 priority areas and and, and just working through i don't know whether that's part of the of the part of the solution of reducing the use of glyphosate chair but it, it's not really formed very well i'm just i'm just listening and thinking so i'm sorry if it's not quite clear no that that that, that seems clear to me i think i think communications uh, with residents and from residents is, is is incredibly important and i think that's what a number of um members have, have, have said and I think that's what you're saying now that this is a, a piece of work we need to do to find out what residents want and make sure that we if, if we are phasing out we you know in all seriousness that we we at least start to do it in, in the right places um yeah i i think i think the the, the communication side of it is, is going to be absolutely critical so that um we can explain to people why we're doing what we're doing um and make you know make sure they're on board um thanks for that colin has anybody else got anything to say we look at the recommendations then so it, it, we are being recommended to note the contents of the report and the outcomes of the trials uh, to note that glyphosate will not be used for weed control operations across parks and countrysides, just with limited ex exceptions as set out in the report. To note that the exercise to trial alternative methods of weed control will continue during the next 12 months, with committee updated further following this. Um, are we okay to um, agree this? I, I propose that we, we move that we agree this. Yeah, agree. I think that agreement just prepared to second that chair so we can agree it by assent if there's everyone's in agreement you all agreed yeah. brilliant thank you so that's moved thank you very much thanks colin thank you chair thank you members good night night So moving on to item 10 which is the car parking charges and this was a working group um a, a, a cross-party working group of this committee um, and we looked at um, a whole series of options that have been brought to the committee um, and made our suggestions. So the report, a report was brought to Policy and Resources Committee on the 7th of October um, by the Director of Neighbourhood Services. This report was car parking charges options and it informed members of considerations for the um, reintroduction of the 
current car parking charges in Wirral in 2020-21 and alternative options for parking charges in 21-22 and beyond. The group reported the upcoming transport strategy um, review study and recommended that any future transport strategy consults with members and residents to ensure that it is environmentally, economically and socially sustainable. The group also recommends that a comprehensive review and survey is undertaken in Wirral as to the local impact of car parking charges on footfall and spend in retail areas and the high street. The group considered the request made by the Policy and Resources Committee to consider the options um, which were attached in the appendix of this report. And after much debate, members considered the following options were acceptable and they wished to submit them to the Policy and Resources Committee for consideration. And we, they, they were a whole series of options. We were very much in agreement, really. Um, I think five out of six um, of the members of the working group agreed on one particular option, which was the option four. Um, and that was to reintroduce parking charges um, immediately. But of course, it won't be immediately because PNR has said no parking charges till the end of the year. Uh, and then there was uh, a member wanted option six was to reintroduce charges at long stay and on street. Um, but in, in both cases, there were members expressing concerns that country parks shouldn't have charges reintroduced until lockdown was finished. Um, there was also, we were also, um, we are recommended to note the findings of this working group, um, which is in, which you should all have a copy of. Are we okay to, to note the recommendations, to note the findings of the working group? Are there any questions or comments about these? I think Councillor Wright has a hand up, Chair. Alison? Hello, yes. Um, it says, for the, as you say, we note the findings of the working group attached in Appendix 1 of the report and agree to the recommendations. Well, I have to say that we would not, um, as a group here, um, agree to the option four or six here um, because of... Uh, a worry. I know it, it says about um, the panel recommends the comprehensive review and survey. That's fine. And undertake in Wirral to local impact of car parking charges on football and looking at the high street and so on and so forth. But it is a real worry, isn't it? Because businesses are going to take some time to recover uh, from this extremely difficult time. Talking to businesses, it's been quite a trial and to recommend the reintroduction of parking charges immediately. I know it's not literally immediately, but you're considering, you know, giving them the run up to Christmas, um, and uh, which is fine, but um, they will take time to recover. Um, and we, you know, as a group, we, we couldn't um, recommend the introduction of any any parking charges, I'm afraid. So we wouldn't be voting or agreeing to that recommendation of option four or six. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alison. That, that is a little strange, I have to say, because you, you were actually part of the working group and it was Councillor Cox, who's, who's here um, as a Conservative member, who actually voted for the option six, which you're now saying you don't want. And I think, I think that there was a, a Conservative councillor who voted for option four. So that. Right, Chair, if I could, I'll just try and explain how working groups uh, actually work, because clearly you don't know. Um, but there are options that are uh, discussed, and the options then go to the committee for debate, and then a. Uh, Points of order, there, Chair. Uh, that's unacceptable. Points of uh, order. It's, well, I, well I it's, it's, it's also clearly to... factual, Tony. Um, because the point of order, uh, Chair, the, could you sorry. ask that when you are speaking, you are not interrupted um, and people wait to be allowed to speak by the chair? And I've, I've raised that on a point of order. So I'm sorry, Chair, that I almost seem to be doing it. But I'm really I'm fed up with people butting in. It's very hard to follow. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, everybody. Um, Tony, I, I do appreciate what you're saying, but at the same time, 
the working you were actually on this working group and you personally voted for um, option six you didn't have to vote for option six but you did and all i was doing was drawing attention to that fact that you announced it was, it was recommended to actually come with the uh, to this committee with the caveat of a full review correct um if uh, if the uh, group as a whole wishes to do something different then they're entitled to that's why the working group brings recommendations to the committee to debate which is what's exactly happening now that, what you're saying, yeah, what you're saying makes sense that you have changed your mind, Ben. Um, as a group, you don't follow what Tony Cox was saying in the working group, which is, which is, as, as Tony has pointed out, that's perfectly reasonable. It's also reasonable that I point out that members of the working group are now currently changing their mind and voting for something else. Um, Excuse anybody else have anything to say about that? Alison. Can I come in, uh, Chair? I don't recall I was a, a deputy on the first meeting of that working group, and I did actually make it very clear to you that I would not be making any decisions, and I wasn't um, aware of the options at that stage. They were not um, presented to us, I believe. So. I did not actually uh, say and make any decision on anything, uh, actually. I, I, my recollection was to consult widely with businesses and also to suggest, as you have suggested here, and it's part of this report, uh, to consult with the World Chamber of Commerce, if you recall. Mm. Which we did, um, yes. Thanks, Alison. We we did in the, in the second part, which is the part where Councillor Cox took place, and as the conserv as a Conservative representative on that working group, he then voted for option six, which was to reintroduce parking charges at Longstay and On Street and country parks, but not shoppers' car parks. Um, does anybody else have anything to say about that? I think we'll just go to the vote then on the recommendations. Um, Chair, Councillor Norbury and Councillor um, Berry have put their hands up. Okay, Councillor Norbury. Tony? Mand appears to have gone down now, Chair. Oh, back up again. Oh, oh Tony Norbury? Yeah, sorry, Chair. Yeah, uh, happy, happy to go to the vote uh, if that's what you you want to do, Chair. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Did anybody else have anything to say before we vote? Uh, I did make say, in the chat. I did ask for comments. I mean, again, I, we would have hoped had we not one of the great uh, ideas of moving to the committee uh, system was that we would try and knock things out, make recommendations, and I think. The majority of the committee, I don't know how the vote's going to go, see the common sense option of a car park and being used as a way of managing numbers at some of our busier car parks. Um, otherwise, you know, staff, everyone who could park there all day and go and work in Liverpool if we have no charge. So there's always a, a need for control of, of uh, inflow and outflow of car parks because that's what car parking charges are, the car parking and part of the a management scheme. Um, but I think what's happened between the working party and now is the the the, the iron whip has been uh, you know the, the has been struck and we're clearly seeing the old party politics returning from the conservatives. I'm more than happy to go to the vote. When we look at some of the other budget options that are being faced by this committee, it's a, I almost see it as a negation of responsibility not to um, not not to do what every other council's doing. All the other councils on Merseyside have reintroduced them. Uh, I would also add, um, that even the government won't recompense us for not um, putting car parking charges as part of the COVID uh, recompense. And also the LGA, when we've asked under the capitalisation um, initiative, said, well, this is money that you have basically not not been uh, involved in collecting and that was a decision of yours a right decision up till january but at some point we do have to be normal and control parking through charges uh what what the review and what the pricing will be will be decided probably at, at pnr but i think i think the right the, the working group seems to have come to a very common sense decision um and now we're seeing the old party politics back 
Thanks, thanks, Steve. I think it's a shame because the um, the working group did come to uh, quite a amicable and, and uh, agreed consensus, really. Um, so it is a shame if people have been whipped to change their mind. And I do agree um, that the the budget situation at the moment across the country, and and I, I'm obviously most familiar with the situation here, is is very worrying. And if people do want to 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 jeopardise our budget and potentially um, create a situation where we might need to cut jobs or cut services because we've just given away money with, you know, when we could go back to the situation we had previously with parking charges. We're not asking to increase parking charges particularly, we're just asking to go back to the situation we had before. Um, I think that's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very serious thing if we're going to potentially have to cut other services and cut jobs because of, uh, just because of parking charges when people were quite happily paying them before. But yes, if, if nobody's got anything, any other questions about this, then I think it's time to go to the vote because this has been a long meeting. I think, Chair, there are a number of hands up. We've got Councillor Berry with his hand up, Councillor Wright, Councillor Cook and Councillor Corkill. Okay. okay, I've got those. Councillor Berry, Bruce? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, um, obviously, um, we, we, th this is um, a subject that we've debated long and hard. And... Um, you know there are there are obviously um, points of view to, for and against, um, but m my personal opinion is that um, you know there are people that are really struggling still uh, financially, and uh, although you know we would like money to be coming flowing into the council, yes I agree, but you know surely we need to look after the people within Whittle. We need to protect them, uh, and you know we're in a we're still in a very very serious situation uh, as far as the the pandemic is concerned. You know we're a long way from from seeing the end of it, even though the vaccination is fast approaching, uh, and we need to look at the welfare of, of our citizens. And I believe that it now is not the time to reintroduce parking fees, and um, and. Uh, well, we need we need to to, to take a, a wholesome look at this and um, and put party politics aside. It should be about the residents of Whittle, about what is best for them, particularly financially at this particular time. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Thanks, thanks, Councillor Barry. Uh, I, I think there is agreement that it is about the. Um, residents because uh, uh, my point before about if we don't introduce parking charges if we don't get um, uh, you know the capitalization plan doesn't go ahead because we haven't done everything we can to balance the budget and I think if we have to make drastic cuts to services if things have to close and if possibly if jobs are, are on the line and we haven't uh, simply reintroduce parking charges which were very generous compared with other authorities and which people were perfectly happy to pay beforehand. Um, I, th I think we would be negligent, to be honest, in our duty towards those residents, uh, particularly those residents who, who might be hard up because they're, they're the ones that usually are most reliant on our services and most need their jobs. Um, we've also got questions and comments from Councillor Corkill, Andy. Yeah, thanks, Liz. I'm just a bit flummoxed. We we debated long and hard, but very well on on this subject in the working group, and communication is good, and it was really good joining the working group. And I guess it's not as good within certain groups as it was on the on the working group because it's just I'm a very odd at what's happened. Some of the things people asking for have already happened. The, the talking to commerce, for example, some of the things that are being asked for are or are going to happen with the recommendation is in the widening consultation. And some of the points being made were dealt with in the working group in that there's not massive evidence to suggest that people won't go shopping if they have to pay. So I'm happy to go to, the, to a vote right now on this. Thanks, Andy. Um I think there's one last um, question from Councillor Cook, and then we'll go to the vote because we, I did move to vote on this. Councillor Cook? Yeah, very quickly then. Yeah, really, my point was, was just endorsing what um, 
I couldn't predict uh, Councillor Corker was going to make. But the other thing is, yes, in all circumstances, we should be out to support the most vulnerable uh, residents. But the most vulnerable residents aren't those who can afford to run cars and pay the petrol and the maintenance and road tax, insurance, and everything else, you know. Um, so, so that would be my argument. Um, and also the, the fact there isn't evidence base uh, to suggest, in fact, um, it wasn't raised at the, well, it was raised at the, um, working group but nobody provided any evidence to suggest that uh, no parking charges support a business okay i'll leave it there thanks thanks thank you chris yeah i, I think uh, having moved to go to the vote i think it's time to go to the vote now so um i i'm moving that we note the findings of the working group attached to this report and that we agree the recommendations um, I think it's a, it's a shame that um, people have been whipped to U-turn on that, and we did work well, as Andy pointed out. Um, does anybody second that we move this? I second. second. I'll second it. Right, okay, that's well and truly seconded, Vicky. Is that okay? Yes, thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks so, to you to vote. Okay. Councillor Berry? <clears throat> Against. Councillor Cameron? I'm voting against a Wirral wide proposal. It's not nuanced. It Sorry, needs Helen, to be hyper local. Helen, doing a vote, Helen. We're not making a speech. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Four. Councillor Cox. Against. Councillor Corkill. Four. <laughs> Councillor Gray. Four. Councillor Fawkes. Four. Councillor Muspratt. Four. Councillor Norbury. Four. Councillor Williams. Four. And Councillor Wright. Against. That's carried chair seven four. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Becky. That brings us on to the um, item 11, which is the Environment, Climate Emergency and Transport Committee Work Programme. Um, and I don't believe, I'm not sure what, um, anything, any notes on this. We've got, I've got that I'd like to put down a few points that I'd like to add to the, to the um, work programme. Does anybody else have anything to add, having looked at the work programme, which was in the notes? Does anybody have anything to add before I talk about this? Councillor Cameron has a hand up, Chair. Helen? Yeah, thank you. Only to repeat what I mentioned um, at the start of this long meeting in the minutes. Um, obviously, I requested something go on there. I don't know why it didn't, um, but I would like us to approach the ever never ending problem of litter. Yes, good point. Chair, I have my hand up. Sorry. Is that Christina? Y yes. Um, unless I'm reading this wrong, um, we've already done, we've already had a working group on allotments. It's just reported back. So I would have thought that it would be better to um, have had reports back to this committee on the uh, progress of the actions that we've already agreed on, not yeah. as a working party. Yes, I agree with that. Does anybody have any objections? Because we have we have already covered allotments. Um, it was very, very well covered by the previous scrutiny committee, uh, and we've already covered it here as well. So um, updates would be would be um, a good idea there. And could we make sure that litter is, is noted as Helen put forward, uh, which is something that that um, residents do care about great a great deal. I'd also like to see. Um, I'd like to see the road safety working group brought forward um, or a workshop. I'd like to see that brought forward um, on the work program as early as possible and, and an update for, from officers on road safety, please, on the, on the, the progress that's being made towards um, the road safety um, plan. Does anybody else have anything to add to this? We've got, I know we've got an agenda setting meeting, but um, this is the, 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 the whole plan. And Councillor Wright has a hand up chair and Councillor Cook also has his hand up. Thank you. Alison? Thank you, Chair. Could I just um, add that um, 
Can we confirm that Hoy Lake Beach management is on the schedule at the next environmental committee agenda uh, on the next uh, environmental committee agenda? Uh, only it's um, it says on the information that just waiting for uh, to be sh uh, scheduled. Could I please suggest that it's it is done, you know, scheduled on the I'm not next. Gonna, I'm not going to agree to anything being on the actual agenda for the next meeting because we've got an agenda setting meeting on on Monday. So that's that's when that happens. But it obviously it, it's on the the plan. Yeah, so it can be discussed at the agenda setting meeting on Monday. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor, I think has his hand up, Chair. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Councillor Cook. Chris, thanks, Nikki. Yeah, Chris? yeah. So I'd just like to support the chair's recommendation that we, um, yeah, prioritise um, setting up a working group to consider the very important issue of road safety. Um, Sorry, Chris, did you finish then? Yeah, did you hear that? Yes, I had. I had finished. Yeah, I was trying to keep it brief. <laughs> I've had to cut myself <laughs> short there suddenly, yeah. Caught me by surprise. Uh, yes, thanks, Chris. It's, it's glad to know that you agree. Um, anybody else have any comments? Vicky, is there anybody else with a hand up? Because my system's not showing. No, I can't see anybody else with a hand up at the moment, Chair. So is the committee uh, moving that we note that report uh, subject to the addition of those items that have been flagged up? That, that, that would be great if we could do that. And is that agreed by assent? Sorry, and the deletion of allotments in it. Yes. That's been, has that been noted? Brilliant. Yes. Brilliant. That, that's really good. Thank you. Has everybody, everybody's agreed with that? Yes. Thank you. So I think that uh, unless anybody else has got anything to say um, or add to that, that, that brings us to the end of the meeting. Has anybody got anything else that they need to add to that? Yeah, yeah, only to say, in the interest of health and well-being of all members and officers, we have been two hours, 50 minutes in front of a PC without without a break. Um, yeah. So, and I probably more to blame as anyone because I speak too much, but, but really, in terms of health and safety and mental well-being, um, I think we just need to have a think about how we, how we go forward. Yeah. Point taken. I think that's really important. Thanks very much. With that in mind, then well, I'll close the meeting. And can I, at this point, thank all the members for taking part uh, and for you know um, a very good and positive um, meeting. Um, and can I thank the officers for all the time and effort that goes into preparing these meetings, running these meetings, and um, ensuring that that or uh, well, basically that we all behave ourselves. So I really, really do appreciate that. Thank you very much, and thank you for the people putting up with the technical difficulties that I've had as well. Um, thank you very much. The meeting's over. Thank you.